and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn once again from the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, for those of you that like to uncover ancient mysteries and hidden secrets, this ride is for you. The Giants of Tartaria, guaranteed to be more fun than a Chinese balloon. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? Once again, from the Pearson Barn, we're here to do this show. I know we're so excited to be here. I know David is. We were talking before the show. This is going to be one of those interesting ones that people like us love. And if you're not like us, you may not love it. You may you may have to change the channel because for some people, they don't really care about learning about the roots of civilizations. They don't care about learning biblical stuff. But for those of you guys that do, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be something that really just kind of um, changes the way you look at the Scripture, which is our goal in every show. And if you can't tell, our goal is to make people take a deep look at Scripture. Let's get started. Let's kick it off. You guys are ready. I know you guys are because I am. So let's do this. Let's go. All right. The Giants of Tartaria. And this is another example of the wealth and the depth of information we can find from studying the book of Enoch and basically we're going from a study of the book of Enoch chapter 68 and from there we're going to go to the giants of our Tartaria and these dots connect in a way that's just amazing but Enoch chapter 68 is a short chapter and it consists of an angelic conversation between the angel Michael and the angel Raphael and there are three statements that are made from Michael to Raphael. And this is the context of Enoch 68. Now, we'll give just a little bit of background on who Michael and Raphael are in the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. It says of Raphael, in the books of Tobit and First Enoch, Raphael is one of the seven angels who stand in God's presence, identified as one of the archangels. And it also we're going to see that Raphael appears in the King James Apocrypha in the book of Tobit. It says, uh, continuing, it says, Raphael hears the prayers of Tobit and Sarah and comes to their assistance. Disguised as a human, Raphael accompanies Tobit's son Tobias on his journey. And it, it goes on to say, he protects Tobias from the demon Asmodeus, who has killed Sarah's first seven husbands on their wedding night. I think this could very well be the, the lady that Jesus was talking about in Luke 20. But anyway, we see here in Enoch chapter 10 and verse 4, Raphael is an aggressor against the demonic powers. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is Dudael, and cast him therein. Raphael is a powerful guy. He binds uh, Azazel. We also see him in the book of Tobit in the King James Apocrypha binding the devil Asmodeus, and we saw this uh, devil Asmodeus in a previous ride in the, uh, in the Testament of Solomon. In, in the book of Tobit, it says, And now God hath sent me to heal thee and Sarah thy daughter-in-law. I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, 
which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. And in the book of Tobit, chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, So the prayers of them both were heard before the majesty of the great God. And this is the role that Tob, that Raphael plays. He's one of the seven archangels. And we know Michael. We're familiar with Michael, I think most of us. And in, uh, in the dictionary, it says this of Michael. Michael and Gabriel are the only two angels mentioned by name in the Bible. Michael is identified only at Daniel 10, 13, 21, and 12, 1, where he is described as one of the chief princes of the people of God. And when we look at what the scripture says about Raphael and about Michael, they are the chief restrainers with the angels of God. We are erroneously told by uh, modern theology that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2. Nowhere do we see the Holy Spirit playing this role, but we see the angels restraining directly and binding these powers, Raphael and Gabriel. And in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 21, but I will shew thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. And if you would look that word holdeth up in your Strong's Concordance, you would see that that word means very specifically to restrain. So in Enoch chapter 68, we've set the stage. We have these two powerful angels, the two big guys. They're the restrainers of evil. And they're having a conversation, and it hinges around the episode of the judgment of the watchers that sinned with the, the episode of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, like I said in Ezekiel or in, in Enoch 68, the chapter in, in, entails three statements from Michael to Raphael. Let's read the first one. And after that, my grandfather Enoch gave me the teaching of all the secrets in the book of the parables which had been given to him and he put them together for me in the words of the book of the parables. And on that day, Michael answered Raphael and said, The power of the Spirit transports and makes me to tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets, the judgment of the angels. Who can endure the severe judgment which has been executed and before which they melt away? Now, we were talking on just a very recent midnight ride about the hot springs and the angels of the waters, and we saw the fallen angels there being punished literally in boiling water and boiling metal. And the book of Enoch in the 67th chapter, it claimed that when the hot springs bubble up, this is because in the subterranean levels, this is where these angels are being punished. Now, that's rough. Now, here, here, we got Michael and Raphael. They're saying, "Man, this is this is tough, man." And these, they're literally trembling. It says, like, yeah, trembling. yeah, they're trembling because, and you know, these guys were formerly their pals. Yeah, I mean, they used to be together, and and this scripture speaks of it here, Job thirty-eight: "Who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it?" Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So they were once all together, they were fellow workers for the Father, and then something went wrong. And we'll be getting into detail in the next ride just exactly what transpired to incite the angels to this fall. But they were they were shook up that these mighty, mighty, powerful angels were trembling at the sight of their former companions being boiled in hot metal and water in the heart of the earth. I mean, it was rough. Now, in Enoch 68 and chapter 3, the second statement is, And Michael answered again and said to Raphael, Who is he whose heart is not softened concerning it, and whose reins are not troubled by this word of judgment that has gone forth upon them because of those who have thus led them out. And they are deeply troubled almost to the point 
of fussing with the father just a little bit that, you know, you're being too hard on these guys. Now, in the final statement here, in Enoch chapter 68 and verse 4, it says this. Now, you notice now when Michael comes into the presence of the father, it all changes. Yeah. You know, he, he changes his tone completely. He's yeah. not fussing with the father anymore, Carol. Yeah. And in, 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 in verse 4, it says, And it came to pass, when he stood before the Lord of Spirits, Michael said thus to Raphael, I will not take their part under the eye of the Lord. He ain't going to stick up from them. Uh, nah. For the Lord of Spirits has been angry with them because they do as if they were the Lord. Therefore, all that is hidden shall come upon them forever and ever, for neither angel nor man shall have his portion in it, but alone they have received their judgment forever and ever. So now Michael and Raphael, they're on the team, they're not fussing, and they go ahead and execute that which the Father gave them to do. Now, in Enoch chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, And has created and given to man the power of understanding the word of wisdom, so hath he created me also and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers, the children of heaven. This is one of my favorite parts of the book of Enoch, where Enoch actually goes and rebukes these fallen angels. And you just got to love it because here's these giant watchers. They come down. They're breeding a race of giants. And the Lord sends Enoch, that this little human, just like you and I, he walks over and he's rebuking these fallen angels. Mm -hmm. This should let us know and it should encourage our hearts of the victory and the authority that we have in Christ over these fallen powers. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to do a little midnight ride backmasking or unmasking the backmasking. Now, we've studied many, many uh, accounts of pagan mythology, and we've seen over and over that what we call mythology, they call theology, and that behind these myths and legends, there was a, 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 an event that was true, which is being retold over and over in different ways with different names of gods and different scenarios. Now, what is being told here in, in Ezekiel, in Enoch chapter 68, the satanic version of that is the story of Prometheus. And in the story of Prometheus, we have the same scenario retold in their way. Now, in Prometheus, we're going to read the story of Prometheus from uh, the Collier's New Encyclopedia. And this new encyclopedia is a 1921. <laughs> so I like that. But we're going to read the story of Prometheus here. And Prometheus rebelled against Zeus. And for his punishment, he was sentenced to eternal liver nibbling. And he was chained to a rock. And his judgment was to have his liver nibbled on by a vulture forever. And when in the story, when they were telling the angels, or, or these, uh, not the angels, but these other gods to chain Prometheus to the rock, the whole scenario, like Enoch 68's unfolding, oh, you know, the regret, you know, yeah. wow, you know, he was one of us. You know, the whole story of the reluctance to chain Prometheus to the rock is retold, and it's the same story as Ezekiel 6, or 68. So it, we see here the story of Prometheus is their version of these events here. And it's very, very profound. And this is going to land us in Tartaria very, very quickly. Now, we're going to read the account of Prometheus from the Collier's 1921 Encyclopedia. And it's, it's you know, these things are just so right in your face. But it begins by saying that Prometheus is the son of the Titan Japetus. Now, I wonder who Japetus might be. This is obviously Japheth, yeah. you know. And the Titans, of course, the Titans were the, uh, in the, they were what the Greeks called the giants. They called them the Titans. And the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. Now, Tartarus is the, the place where the Tartarians take their name from Tartarus. This is an established fact. We're going, to, we're going to look at that. So this takes us immediately here to uh, Japheth and the scripture into Tartaria. Now let's look at Genesis 10. Oops, sorry. 
Genesis chapter 10, and it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or, and they spell it J E P E T U S, Japetus. And that is the, in their story, they change it to Japetus, but it's obviously what they're talking about as we go on. And, and unto them were, were sons born after the flood, and the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Mesheth, and Tyrus. And the, the people of Japheth, they settled in this area by the uh, Caucasian mountains, where the word Caucasian comes from, the area there to the north of the, the Black Sea, and the Tartarians, and we're going to show you some maps here in just a minute, but from this area in the Black Sea, right there at the area of, of Ukraine, it, they went all the way through China, there to the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, and in our broadcast this evening, we are going to trace them as they migrated to the south. And we're going to find some amazing things. And if you think about it, in the Greeks, the Greeks talked about the Titans, the giants. And the Greek story, it was Tartarus that was the place where the giants were imprisoned after, by Zeus after they rebelled. Now, in Second Peter 2 and 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That word hell there is the Greek word Tartarus. So in scripture, we see legitimacy being given to the concept of these giants being chained in Tartarus. So basically, the word of God is saying, yeah, um, they've got the basic story right, but uh, of course, theirs is the demonic version of it. Now, these are some ancient maps of Tartaria, and John, why don't you just speak to those? If you look at maps today, you're not going to see Tartaria, but here on these ancient maps, you can see what we have here. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, one of the books I think you turned me on to, David, is the Maps of the Sea Kings, I believe. Yeah, right? Charles good Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Yes, and, and a lot of these maps you can find in that book, but, you know, I'll tell you, the, you, can, find, you can still find... Uh, old books like encyclopedias that have these maps david has a few of these encyclopedias that have these maps and also talk about tartaria it's pretty interesting too because as much as they've tried to cover it up they one thing they haven't been able to cover up is they haven't been able to get all the old books and all of the old maps but uh i think that these are only three of the maps but there's i think i think we what we found over 50 maps oh, uh, gaggles, of them. gaggles of them that prove from different people different times that proves that Tartaria is real. So when you when you read that Tartaria is not real, um, if it is a psyop, it's an old running psyop. It's been going for a long time, waiting to pop its head up. You know, this is there's a lot of evidence, a lot of proof of this, and these some of these Tartarian maps make up almost all of the known world. You know, some of them go all the way into California and, yeah. and Alaska. Yeah. And look at that one on the upper left. Yeah. That's North America. Yeah. That's right across into where we are. And yeah. We were talking on the, the Midnight Ride on the Angels of the Waters about French Lick, and I have a book at home on Tartaria that says that the dome at French Lick is Tartarian architecture wow. designed to be uh, to create a certain sound frequency to, to amplify the healing there from the hot springs that are coming up. And looky here, the tart, according to this map, Tartaria was even in the United States. Yep. And for you Midnight Ride fans, you might remember when we did the Midnight Ride on Tartaria and yeah. we talked about how that there were Russians that believed that in 1776 we stole Tartaria from them. Yeah. They yeah. still have that fort. Was it Fort? Um, what is the fort that they were talking about over in California? And, I can't um, remember the name of it, but we, we showed the picture of it, an yeah. ancient fort up there in Northern California and all kinds. Yeah of of evidence that remains to this day of that fact and still this is a claim by russian scholars they I, they know this and they believe that i think that that show is called the uh dragon queen of tartaria if i remember correctly because it talks about caliph caliph the idea of uh, yes in cali and all of those different yes. aspects of these aryan gods because they you know eric cali cali which people find in the vedic texts 
they think oh they think oh it's hindus all indian well the indians are in fact are aryan and their texts uh-huh. that they get all these from are the vedic text which is an aryan text so this is where a lot of this stuff comes from now if we just look before we go on and you can just see a band it, it went from the area right where russia meets with ukraine there in the caucasian mountains it went to the east all the way through china to the pacific ocean and continued in north america the complete expanse of it now i believe and we're going to see some serious reasons to believe that this was the ancient kingdom of lucifer that is spoken of in scripture we're going to see some evidence that would definitely point us to believing that very thing now back again to our colliers encyclopedia and we're going to unpack the story of prometheus just a little more it just gets more amazing it says here prometheus climbed to the heavens by the assistance of minerva and stole fire from the chariot of the sun now in the movie prometheus which had um Charlie Theron and Idris Elba. They there was a rich guy. <laughs> we could relate to this. There was a multi-trillionaire that give a trillion dollars to have a space flight to go to this planet where they could meet their maker. Well, when they got there, the maker was brought back to life. He was a big Nephilim type guy, and lo and behold, maker wanted to kill his creation. And they were trying to figure out, this one girl kept saying, well, who created him? And this plays right into the Kabbalistic narrative where in uh, the the Zohar of the Kabbalah, the Ein Saf is the creator of the God of the Bible. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, but this is what the Kabbalah teaches. It also ties right in with the Nagamati Codices where the creator in the Nagamati codices is Yalbadov, the evil co-creator with God. So this is very much that narrative that we saw there in the Prometheus movie. Now, in this text here, it says that Prometheus climbs to the heavens by the assistance of Minerva. Now, that was the Roman god that was the equivalent of Venus, and it's the equivalent of Lucifer and the planet Venus. And we see here that he stole far from the chariot of the sun. Now, we see here in the next, uh, in the next slide, when it says that uh, he ascended into heaven with the help of Minerva, who is the planet Venus, the goddess representing Venus, this is what we have back in the Lucifer story, don't we? We have Lucifer. Halel ben Shahir, which is another designation for the planet Venus. We see him ascending into heaven. We know the text. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And we see here in the story of Prometheus, it's not only telling us the same scenario that we see in the 68th chapter of the book of Enoch, we're seeing really a retelling of the Lucifer story from their side of it, you see. And in this next text in Isaiah 14, 16, this gives me reason to believe because what we're seeing here, we're seeing not only the retelling of the story of, of Enoch 68, but of the whole Lucifer scenario. And it gives me reason to believe that in that swath of land, the old Tartaria, all the way even into our land, that this was the ancient kingdom of Lucifer that's spoken of. And for those of you that are new to the Midnight Ride, something... Um, that I have maintained for a long time. As a matter of fact, it was the very first presentation I ever did at the um, Exposing Darkness back in 2016 with John, that Lucifer is not another name for Satan, that Lucifer, Lucifer is a Nephilim. And it says here, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? 
And it talks about here the kingdom and the throne of Lucifer. And I believe that ancient Tartaria, this could be very well the, the ancient kingdom of Lucifer. And it talks in the 20th verse here of Isaiah 14. Give me the next slide there, John. There we go. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. And it speaks right here of the Lord erasing the memory of this kingdom of Lucifer. And that's what's happened. You know, people don't. Tartaria is something that's been erased from the mind of mankind because uh, by just stopping talking about it, you know, yeah. and go ahead, John. No, I know I'm at, at all. I'm just reading something here. I was just kind of I'm going to wait till you get done. OK, now let's read another statement here from our Collier's Encyclopedia. It says Jupiter ordered Vulcan to make a woman of clay and endowing her with life, sent her to Prometheus. Prometheus, suspecting the snare, induced his brother to marry her. So we have Prometheus's brother, and we have Jupiter making a woman of clay, wanting Prometheus to mate with her. Prometheus tricks his brother into mating with this clay woman. Now, what's this all about? It sounds a little bit like this, doesn't it? Here... In, um, in the slide in Daniel here, chapter 2, 42 and 43. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, that's Prometheus's brother marrying the little clay woman that Jupiter made, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. And it appears that when uh, Nephilim, uh, they can mate with humans easier than one another. They're almost like mules in that respect, I think. But the, the symbolism here is obvious. You know, what does the clay represent? It represents mankind, and it represents the people of God. And this is Satan's agenda all along to corrupt the human genome through the whole Genesis 6 scenario to, you know, in Jeremiah 8 and 6, O house of Israel, cannot I, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So it's just in your face here, the story of Prometheus. It's the entire genesis 6 scenario and it's the story of lucifer and as we look at this i i have more and more of uh, indication that that old kingdom of lucifer and the kingdom of tartaria is the very same thing now let's think about vulcan for just a little bit now this is the old guy vulcan here the god of fire and of smelting iron and I always think when I see this, when you look at the Capitol Dome and you look up, George Washington is floating up there with old Vulcan. You mm -hmm. know, he's one of the people riding the sky there in the Capitol Dome of this good Christian nation. Yeah. Now, Vulcan, in, uh, there's a book here, and he was the one in the Prometheus story that made the woman of clay for Prometheus's brother to mate with. And in this book here, John Yarker, the Arcane Schools, Yarker, he was a fine fella. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley's, so you knew he was an upright fella. And here in the Arcane Schools, he says this. And boy, he's even got him a little backward swastika on that. So you know he's got to be a fine fella. But he goes on, he says here in this book, he says, all the authorities are agreed that the mysteries practiced under this name were allied with the Cyclopean mysteries. And he says, equally, Tubal Cain and Chrysor is the Vulcan of Greek mythology. Now, this is basically Luciferian Freemasonic theology, and they equate the god Vulcan with Tubal Cain of the Bible. And there, as we see, he goes on to say, uh, 
he said he also supposes that the confession of Lamech may hint at the beginning of human sacrifice. So their understanding is that the worship of Vulcan, this goes back to Tubal Cain. Now here we have the 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 whole story of the line of Cain, the the worship of human sacrifice and the intermingling of the the human and the angelic genome. And we see here the story in scripture. It talks about Tubal Cain, and this in Freemasonry is the password of the fellow calf degree, Tubal Cain. It's the Masonic password you give with the handshake. It says in Zilla, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zilla, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Also, theoretically, when we read about what the the Word of God says about Cain being a refuge in the earth, some believe that it's even possible that some of these people of Lamech, for fear of being killed and avenged, actually took shelter in the heart of the earth. Now, this takes us again to Balkane. This takes us right back to Tartaria. This whole story just has little pointers and indicators that point us back to this region. And in Ezekiel 38 and 2, this is the Gog and Magog packet, uh, passages here. And it says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshish, and to Baal. Right there, we have two ball right here again. We're right back in Tartaria and prophesy against him. Now, we're going to look at Josephus, and now we're going to begin tracking these Tartarians as they go to the south. And this is some really uh, amazing stuff, and it's so easy to verify historically. It is not difficult at all. In the book of Josephus, on page 36, it says, um, For Gomer founded those who the Greeks call Galatians Gaul, but were then called Gomerites. Magog founded those that were from him named Magogites. And it goes on to say, Of the three sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz founded the Ashkenazians, who are now called by the Greeks Regenian. So we see that there's a direct connection between these people that are called the Gauls and the Scythians with the people in Galatians. Now this is a 1929 encyclopedia, uh, the World Book of Knowledge, and I'll read a little bit about the Tatars and the Tartarians. You can find a lot of information about, and sometimes it's spelled T-A-T-A-R. And uh, I'll just read what it says here. It says, Tatar took the form Tartar at an early date by association with the word Tartarius or Hades. So they originally were called Tatars, but because they wanted to be associated with hell and the heart of the earth, they called themselves Tartars because of this place where the giant uh, uh, Japetus uh, Prometheus all goes back to. It's amazing. Now, it goes on to say, and I love this, it says there is an there is also an expression, scratch a Russian and you find a Tartar, meaning that beneath the veneer of Russian civilization lies the ferocity of a Tartar. That just makes me think that uh, maybe they might want to be careful uh, about scratching Mr. Putin too many times. A little of that uh, Tartarian ferocity might erupt upon them. Now, in the next uh, little uh, thing I want to read here, and this is from the um, 1937 Encyclopedia Americana, it says, 
the Tartars were a nomadic people anciently spoken of as the Scythians. So we can document that the Scythians and the Tartars are the same people. When these Tartarians begin to migrate to the south down into Asia Minor, they were known as the Scythians and then as the Gauls. It's all the same people as we trace them down in their migration to the south. It says the true Tatars form part of the horde of Genghis Khan. And if you know anything about Genghis Khan, he was known for his ferocity. The whole of uh, the Khans of the Tartarians in Star Trek, they picked up the narrate of the wrath of Khan. You know, these are big, they're bad, and they did things that they were the original terrorists. They did things to, they didn't just kill you, but they killed you with style, and they did innovative things to the people's bodies uh, after that they had killed them. Now, in the uh, natural history here of Pliny the Elder, we're going to read about some things, and in as we come down into Gaul, Gaul is the region there in Asia Minor where the Apostle Paul founded a church, and he wrote the epistle to the Galatians to the Gauls. Now, I want to read from Pliny the Elder. This is uh, chapter, book two, volume two, in his natural history, I'm going to read from page 62 about some strange goings on down in the area of Gaul. When these creatures, or well, not creatures, well, some of them were creatures, when these uh, Gomerian giants, as we're going to read, um, Steve Quayle in Genesis 6 Giants has a good chapter on the Gomerian giants that come from Gomer in Genesis 10 as we trace them downward into the region of Galatia. Then we can also take them right over. They became the Druids. These were the Druidic people as they went um, in, into Britain. But this is what it says about some of the strange going-ons in Gaul. And Pliny the Elder, he was like the Roman Josephus, such a cool guy. I hope he got saved. Um, he actually died when Mount Vesuvius erupted. He, he, was, he was in Pompeii at the wrong time and got buried there by the volcano. But, I mean, he was contemporary with Josephus, and uh, he, uh, j just a cool guy. But I'll read what he had to say here about some strange going on in the area of Gaul. He said, also the governor of Gaul wrote to the late lamented Augustus that a large number of dead Nereids were to be seen on the shore. Now, we're going to show you some picture of some Nereids here in just a little bit. And basically, they're sea nymphs, or what we would call a sea nymph or a mermaid, half fish, half woman. And they actually talked, and you know, this isn't a fairy tale book, and these old books, they talked of the nymphs and the Nereids of being real, and even recounting a letter from the governor of Gaul to Augustus Caesar about these creatures washing up dead on the shore. He said, I have, he said, I have distinguished members of the order of knighthood as authorities for the statement that a man of the sea has been seen by them in the Gulf of Cadiz, that's very near the Straits of Gibraltar, with a complete resemblance to a human being in every part of his body, and that he climbs on board ships during the hours of the night and the side of the vessel that he sits on is at once weighed down, and if he stays there longer, actually goes below the water. He goes on to talk about a monster that was found in this area. He says the skeleton of the monster to which Andromeda in the story was exposed was brought by Marcus Scarus from the town of Jaffa in Judea and shown at Rome, among the rest of the marbles during his edelship, it was 40 feet long, the height of the ribs exceeding the elephants of India, and the spine being one foot six inches thick. All kinds of strange animals and strange creatures were showing up in this area, and it can directly be attributed to the migration of these uh, Gomerian giants as they come down from Tartaria, into the area here of Asia Minor. And, you know, just to back that up, too, there's a book called The Imminent Invasion of Israel that talks about, uh, and I'm just going to read this part right here. 
and this is I can find this and this is a Schofield Study Bible as well, but there's other other sources for this. It says the primary reference to the northern powers headed by Russia all agreed the reference to Meshek and Tubal was Moscow and Tobolsk, and it's a clear identification. Then it goes on to say that they went down by the Caspian Sea and all the area Black Sea and all that stuff that you're talking about uh, as well here. So I mean there's there's a lot of evidence that that proves this, which is interesting because this is not something I ever understood or, or knew as you know being a possibility uh, you, you just never think of that as even di the etymology of words is so interesting when yeah. it comes to this yeah. you know yeah and of course when you take the word tatar tartar tartaria rip it from the modern mindset of mankind you're yeah. never going to connect these dots yeah but just do a little digging the dots start connecting yep. and a lot of things start making a lot more sense now this is a picture of what uh, in uh, Pliny's Natural History, he records a letter from the uh, governor of Gaul to Augustus Caesar about a number of these creatures washing up dead on the shore. Uh, they maybe had a train derailment, you reckon? And a little, to <laughs> a little toxic chemicals got in the water? Must you know, a little, that, little of that uh, rainbow water maybe? I don't know. But anyway, this nearid, uh, here's a picture of what we're talking about. These, uh, uh, call them what you want. We've got, uh, they're like, they live in the sea. They're female. The like, sea hookers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's about uh, what they can. Of course, they're very much like the nymphs, which is um, a, 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 a sexual connotation, the mermaid and all of these things. But the, there's actual records that they, they and you know, this isn't a, a fairy book. This is a very credible history book that is recording these events. And he said that, yeah, right up here, uh, the governor of Gaul said, man, you know, we got these things washing up on our shore. You know, a bunch of these nerds. Um and as we go on here, I'll read a little bit from Genesis 6 Giants by Steve Foyle. And he has a good chapter in this book on the Gomerian Giants. As we trace them, we, we trace them coming down from the Caspian Sea area right down into Asia Minor where we see uh, Galatia and Paul writing the epistle to the church he founded in Galatia. Now, it says here, this is on page 214, it says the Cimbri or the Cimmerians after making their way overland by the northern route, occupied for a time the country above the Euxine or Black Sea around the Paulus Metoidus. When they again felt the irresistible urge to roam, they continued westward, eventually settling east of the Rhine in Germany. They afterward established themselves as far north as Denmark and also colonized Belgium, Akman's hordes, meanwhile, having advanced by the southern route, first settled in Cappadocia and Galatia, and then later on the southern shores of the Black Sea. From there they spread into Gaul, which today we call France, and also across from Spain, where they assimilated from the Iberians and thus became known as the Celtiberians. Being as prolific in Europe as they had been in Asia, Gomer's oversized children soon spread over a vast territory from the lands east of the Rhine to the Atlantic and from the Baltic Sea to the coast of Spain. They also inhabited Switzerland and some northern parts of Italy, especially around the Adriatic. So he rightly traces the migration of these people. Basically, they just spread and uh, they just went out in all kinds of directions. Now, I'm going to read something from this collection of books called The Great Books of the Western World. We're going to read from volume six here. And this is the writings of Herodotus. And he talks about the behavior of these Scythian warriors. And we, we already we read the documentation from the old encyclopedia that the Scythians were the Tartarians. This is what they called, what they were called as they moved to the south. And it says here, this is another, this is a Roman historian, Herodotus. He says, uh, the Scythian soldiers drinks the blood of the first man he overthrows in battle. Whatever number he slays, he cuts off all their heads and carries them to the king, 
since he is thus entitled to a share of the booty. The skulls of their enemies, not indeed. This is on page 134 and 135, if any of you have this set. It says here, the skulls of their enemies, not indeed of all, but of those whom they most detest, they treat as follows. Having sawn off the portion below the eyebrows and cleaned out the inside, they cover the outside with leather. When a man is poor, this is all that he does. But if he is rich, he also lines the inside with gold. In either case, the skull is used as a drinking cup. They do the same with the skulls of their own and the own kin if they have been at feud with them. So these were bad dudes. They'd kill you and they were creative about it. They'd kill you and they'd make a little drinking cup out of your head. You know, these, they would drink your blood and make a cup out of your head. You know, these were bad guys. And they were known, uh, if you know anything about uh, Genghis Khan, and I know that you do, the, the ferocity of, of these people, they were just frightening. You know, they were, they were just a terrifying figure. Now, we're going to look at a old book here. This is the Thomas Scott Bible Commentary. It's one of the, I think it's the oldest set of commentaries I have. It's 1816, and it's still in use. We haven't dry docked it. We're still using it. And I want to read from this to show you how things have changed. The, the very name, Tatar, Tartar, Tartaria, they're meaningless to the modern mind because they have been deliberately ripped from the, the pages of history because these are things that they don't want people to know. But this commentary, which was written in 1816, it says this in the introduction to the epistle of Galatians. Now, what I want to show you is that this has all been changed. Um, if you would read a modern Bible commentary from uh, someone that has come recently out of theological cemetery, they would go into a big deal about, well, we have the Northern Galatian uh, hypothesis and we have the Southern Galatian hypothesis, and we believe the Southern Galatian hypothesis, which basically means the, the truncated story of this is that from the time there were ever Christians until the late 1800s, everybody knew that the book of Galatians was written to the Gallic people. Now, what they say is that the book of Galatians was written to a Roman province called Galatia that weren't the ethnic Gauls. So they have totally severed the connection between the book of Galatians and the Gomerian giants. Now, we're going to understand just how important that is. And these little things that seem insignificant, like who cares, they disconnect the dots that enable us to put together the full picture of the story. Let me read just a little bit from Mr. Scott's introduction to the book of Galatians. He says, the Galatians, or Gallo-Grecians, were the descendants of the Gauls, who migrated from their own country to seek for new settlements and who, after a variety of disasters, got possession of a considerable district in Asia Minor near to Lyconia, Lystra, and Iconum. You can read right in the book of Acts where Paul visited those places on his missionary journeys. It says, it is supposed that they retained their native language and customs at the time when the gospel was first preached among them. Now, this is huge. This is really huge because when we get this, we can really figure some stuff out. Often when I uh, talk about the book of Galatians, I'll say, look at your neighbor and say, the Galatians weren't Jews. Uh -huh. And the Galatians were the Gauls. And just like it says in the Thomas Scott commentary, they were practicing their customs and rituals at the time the gospel was preached to them in about 50 A.D. Now, going on here, we're going to look at the text in Galatians 4, and we're going to see what difference it would make. When we look at the book of Galatians, does it make any difference? Well, northern Galatian, apostles, southern. But it does because when you divorce the Galatians from the ethnic Gauls, and the, the rituals that they were doing, as Thomas Scott said, and every, every commentary from 
when Christ rose from the dead to the late 1800s, it would say the same thing Thomas Scott did, but now, no more, no more. Now, it says here, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, the question is, what were the Galatians going back to? And as Thomas Scott said, at the very time when the gospel was preached to them, they were still practicing the rites and the customs of the, the Gallic people. And we're going to show you just exactly what those are. Get your golden bow ready. We're, we're going to be reading from that. Now, before we go to the Britannic, I just want to read a little commentary here from Thomas Scott on this passage in Galatians. It says, The Galatians had, had formerly been ignorant of the one living and true God and had performed religious service to mere creatures or imaginary beings which by nature were not gods and external observances might accord very well to such objects of worship. So we're not talking about them. They weren't Jews. They never celebrated the Feast of Passover. They did the doggone Gallic rites, which we're going to show you exactly what they were. Now, when, when you sever the book of Galatians from the Gallic people, it's like a little bird. There's a trail of breadcrumbs from Galatians 4 right back to Tartaria, right back to the Gomerian giants, right back to the satanic worship that was instituted by the fallen angels with the sons of God and the daughters of men. When you cut that connection, it's like a little bird just eating those breadcrumbs up to where they don't want anyone to trace that trail back. Now, going forward, it's interesting, too, where those breadcrumbs will take you. He goes on to say, Brother Scott in his commentary, the best illustration of the absurd conduct which the apostle ascribes to the Galatians may be found in the Church of Rome, in which the worship of saints and angels succeeded to that of the inferior deities, the superstitions, and often licentious festivals which were multiplied among them. Well, happy Saturnalia, happy Baal Mass, and it shows the explicit direct satanic nature of that which is done in this celebration of the satanic rites of Baal Mass, which is worshipped under the uh, in the modern abomination that we see that tries to pass itself off as Christianity. Now let's look at the 1771 Britannica. That was the very first edition, and let's read a little article here about the Gali, the Gali. And it says, and the Gali, it says, in antiquity, the priest of the goddess Cybele, who were eunuchs and took their name from Gallus, a river in Phrygia. When a youth was initiated into this order, the custom was to throw off his clothes, to run crying aloud in the midst of the troop, and then drawing a sword to castrate himself. After this, he ran about the streets, carrying in his hands the marks of his mutilation, which he was to throw into a house, and in that house to put on a woman's dress. <laughs> now, have you seen this spirit manifesting oh, lately? Man. Oh, man. Now, I don't think I want to sign up for that, but these golly, these priests, they would literally cut their plumbing off they would put it in their little hands, and they would throw it at a house. And this house had to bring them out a dress to wear. What a horrible religion. That's all I got to say. <laughs> don't, don't wait for me to get in line and sign up for no, that one. Don't <laughs> sign me up for that religion, man. Oh, my gosh. But can we see that same spirit manifesting today? We can't miss it, can we? And we're going to read from the Golden Bough from page 404. And we're going to expand a little bit on the article we saw in the 1771 edition of Britannica. And it says, um, the worship of the Fergian mother of the gods was adopted by the Romans in 204 BC toward the close of their long struggle with Hannibal. Certainly the Romans were familiar, this is on page 404, certainly 
the Romans were familiar with the Gali, who the emasculated priest of Attis before the close of the Republic. Now, it goes on to talk about the great spring festival of Cybele and Attis. On the 22nd day of March, a pine tree was cut in the woods and brought into the sanctuary of Cybele, where it was treated as a great divinity. The duty of carrying the sacred tree was entrusted to a guild of tree bearers. Now, the arch Gaulus. <laughs> the high priest of the Gali was called the Arch Gaulus after the Gauls. In other words, he was the big Gaul, the Arch Gaulus. <laughs> this is right on page 205 or 405, the Golden Bow. It says the Arch, the Archie Gaulus or high priest, drew blood from his arms and presented it as an offering. Nor was he alone in making this bloody sacrifice. Stirred by the wild barbaric music and clashing cymbals, rumbling drums, droning horns, and screaming flutes, the inferior clergy whirled about in the dance and waggling heads and screaming hair until wrapped into a frenzy of excitement and insensible to pain, they gashed their bodies with potsherds or slashed them with knives in order to bespatter the altar of the sacred tree with their flowing blood. This is the, <laughs> there's a couple, <laughs> you know, how to say it, but just to say it, but uh, this is the origin of the balls on the Christmas tree, and this is the origin of the red and green, uh, the Christmas colors, the red and green, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's true. It says that um, uh, pot shirts slash them with knives in order to bespatter the altar of the sacred tree with the flowing blood. The ghastly rite probably formed a part of the mourning for Addis and may have been intended to strengthen him for the resurrection it was on the same day of blood and for this purpose that the novices sacrificed their virility wrought up to the highest pitch of religious excitement they dashed the severed portions of themselves against the image of the cruel goddess just absolutely amazing and this is what the apostle paul was saying you're going to go back into this i fear that I have put labor upon you in vain, you're going to lose your goofy souls. Man, you know, it, I imagine they had a hard time proselytizing and getting people to join that religion. I can't see how anybody would say, you know, like, they, 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 how, how do they appeal to people? Be like, man, if you join our club, you'll get to cut your manhood off and throw it at a tree. Like, how, you know, like, I can't believe it. And now they do these rituals today that are just they're the same thing, but like, I guess in a softer way, I kind of wish they would go back to the old way of doing it. If they're going to do it, might as well go all in. Right. Yeah. Might as well. And th that is to me unthinkable. Yeah. How anyone could go for that. But yet today there are hundreds of young children being coerced into chemical castration. Yeah. And little oh, yeah. girls that are being, um, coerced into these things. It's the spirit of the golly. Yeah, it's, it's still the there, man. The it's still oh, yeah. there. And and parents are not only letting it happen, but some of them are encouraging their children to do such yeah. a thing. Yeah. So Yeah, they actually are. But we see when we peel back the onion that knowing about Tartaria tells us a lot about ourselves and that uh, the things we see unpacked in these stories, it shows us what's going on right now. We are wrestling with these same ancient principalities. And, you know, what can you say? But there it is, um, the giants of Tartaria. Good evening and welcome to the Midnight Ride. I am your host, David Carrico, and we are now live, live, live. That was my cue. <laughs> <laughs> and we are so glad to have you all on board this evening, our broadcast this evening, which will be with my special co-host, John Pounders, uh, Giant Angels Chained in Hollow Earth and the Seething Energies of of Lucifer. We are going to be exploring some absolutely fascinating things that have 
a direct bearing upon the world at large and on all of our lives. So we are very, very looking forward to presenting this information to you this evening. So, All right, David, I appreciate this. And this is, um, this is an interesting topic because it covers so much and it's hard to put it all into one show. But uh, we have done a lot of shows that uh, maybe, be, maybe go into more detail on some of the subjects that we're going to talk tonight. But this one is a uh, very detailed uh, orientation of the idea of the occult and they're tapping into the energies of Lucifer and also tapping into a race of beings that are under the earth or in the earth uh, as this as the scripture talks about the bottomless pit the all these different things so we're going to get into this tonight and talk about it we've done quite a bit of research and I feel like this is probably one of the more important topics because um, there is a coming great deception and this ties into it perfectly, and so we're gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, I got a slideshow here for you guys. So the Vril Society. This is uh, something that is. There's no concrete proof of an actual Vril Society other than people's word and testimony, but the concept of Vril and the underground super race is important to Theosophy and a lot of different other religious books and groups and secret societies. And the claim is that the Vril Society was a secret uh, community of occultists in pre-Nazi Berlin. And they were sort of the inner circle of the Thule Society or the Thule Society. However you prefer to pronounce that, that's fine with me. I don't care. Uh, I'm not, I, I definitely don't always have the proper pronunciations. I know uh, David's perfect at them. But. I am very flexible <laughs> on word pronunciations. I'm known for my flexibility there. So Right. And so there are, and there's also uh, claims that there are, that in the close contact with the English group known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the Golden Dawn. So these all kind of groups tied together into what we're talking about here. So this this book right here, this is The Coming Race by Edward Bulwer Lytton. And this was the book that really fueled this society, this real society. Um, this guy, Lytton, David can tell you a little bit more about him too. But he was, uh, you know, really respected by the theosophists, and he was respected by a lot of secret societies. He actually wrote a book. Um, let, me, let me go to this next thing here. This is the guy right here. This is Lighten. Oh, I'm not even showing the slides. There we go. This is Lighten. He was um, he was royal lineage. He was a wealthy author, and he um, he wrote a book called Zanoni, which is um, is a Rosicrucian novel, and this is one of the things that really made people look at his work. Um, now, this is a fiction book that he wrote, but the interesting things about it that we're going to talk about tonight is the though the names may be changed and the terms that are used for these different things, it is the exact same things that we see in the Vedic text, which I've did an sh entire show on the Vedic text one time and, and on the on these energies and the things you see in Buddhism, the things you see in all the magical religions, Kabbalah, you, you name it, these are the same um, same things that he talks about and also talks about the hollow earth idea behind this. And this is um, really just in, in every aspect, in my opinion, is one of the... Um, most interesting books that I've ever read by and and so Helena, Helena Blavatsky most of you guys know this pretty face right here if you look at the I want you guys to check this out the pose of Lighten here and then the pose of Blavatsky they both have their hand by their face here but she really uh, enjoyed um, Lighten and in her book Isis Unveiled and in the Secret Doctrine she uh, mentions the Vril and she compares it to the energy of the Vedic text, Kabbalah, and other forces. And David, you have a book here with you that you're going to quote. And she also does this in Chapter 5 of Isis Unveiled as well, where she compares all of these different uh, forces as the same as Vril, which I would definitely be in concurrence with her about this force. So go ahead, David. And basically what Lighten did, this was a channeled work in the form of a novel. In our time, uh, this is what L. Ron Hubbard did with Scientology. He was a science fiction writer, and uh, he just brought his channeled science fiction over into religious reality. And when Lighten wrote this novel about this coming race out of the heart of the earth, the Theophysists understood that this was a channeled work 
and they took it as reality. And it is dark spiritual reality. And in this book by Lighten, he talked about the real power. And this real power is the power of the Aetha, the power of the Prana. It's the common denominator of occult power from time immemorial. And in the Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky talked about a man that, uh, and it was published in 1888. Uh, it's not uh, in the modern era at all. And there was a man at that time called Keeley that was making the most sophisticated electric motors in the world. And she says of Mr. Keeley, she talks at great length how Mr. Keeley was using the real power to make these motors, much in the same way that the Nazis supposedly used the real power um, a few decades later to make their flying machines. But it says, uh, she said, it had been stated that the inventor of the self-motor was what is called in the jargon of the Kabbalist a natural-born magician. It is the vril of Bulwer Lighten's coming race and of the coming races of our mankind. And she says that what Mr. Keeley says of sound and color is also correct from the occult standpoint. Hear him talk as though he were the nursling of the God's revealers and had gazed all his life into the depths of father, mother, Aether. And Aether is the modern terminology in the mystery schools for the vril. And last night on FOJC, I talked about the Aether and how the secret of uh, one, one of the textbooks in the mystery schools, it teaches you how to manipulate the aether. This is the same as the vril, the same as the prana. And all of the occult, all the way back to the hermetic mystery schools of Greek and Egypt, it was all about manipulating this force. And when Mr. Lighton wrote this novel, they jumped on it because they knew that it was a spiritual reality. And this formed the basis going forward of the coordination of occult power with scientism. And we're still seeing the results of this scientism falsely so-called. And that's exactly true. And right here, I've got a uh, the Theosophical Society's logo here. And you, what you see here is you see the so-called Jewish star, or whatever you want to call it. You see the Egyptian Ankh, and you see the swastika. You see uh, some Vedic script, and you see all, and you see the serpent eating its own tail. They believe in all these religions, kind of combined into what they're doing. And when we look at the Theosophical Society, there's there's plenty of ties there, and we'll kind of get into some of those later. And to kind of back up your point about people receiving knowledge uh, from these these beings, or not necessarily these beings, but this energy force, the seething energy of Lucifer. We'll call it Vril tonight since we're talking about the Vril, but it's it's really the same thing. Uh, but you see, this is a quote uh, by Manly P. Hall, I'm, and right here he says in The Lost Keys of Freemasonry on page 48, says, when the Masons learn that the key to the warrior on the block is proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mysteries of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step upward, uh, he must approve his ability and apply the energy. So we see this this coming through from Manly P. Hall. For those of you who don't know who Manly P. Hall is, I'm not going to get into too much about it. But David can tell you uh, quite a bit about Manly P. Hall. And, and pretty much anybody that can look on Google can see that this guy is a 33rd degree Freemason. Highly, highly respected among Freemasonry and highly respected in the occult world. Uh, he wrote the secret teaching of all ages. Secret is it secret doctrine or secret teaching of all ages? Yeah, the secret teaching of all ages is it's called. Yeah, he was eulogized when he died in 1990 as Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. And in that book, Secret Teachings of All Ages, there's actually an oath to Lucifer with a place for you to sign your name. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he was not a good guy. Yeah, you know, and he it talks was, about how magicians how magicians can uh, actually sell their soul to be able to have this demon that falls around. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff for sure. And um, so another guy that most of you guys have probably heard of, and and I've done, I guess, really about this subject right here in the show that I did about ancient watchers uh, on Midnight Ride here. We talked a little bit about this, but this is Nikola Tesla. And 
Here's a couple quotes. One says, my brain is only a receiver in the universe. There is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, inspiration, strength and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know that it exists. And then uh, another quote from man's greatest achievements in 1907, it says all perceptible matter comes from a primary substance or tenuity beyond conception, filling all space, the Akasha or luminiferous ether, which is acted upon by the living, giving prana or creative force, calling into existence and in never ending cycles, all things and phenomenon. And the interesting thing about these quotes is this is this doesn't end with these guys. This goes on for mathematicians, the greatest people, the people that have gave the greatest achievements to our world are people that give great credit to this stuff. In fact, um, one of the people that you guys probably familiar or familiar with, if you watch the Ancient Watcher show, we did uh, Oppenheimer. The father of nuclear warfare, he quotes the quotes the um, Vedic text, which is where this concept, some of this concept, come from, as well as the other ones. And he says, "I become death, the destroyer of uh, destroyer of worlds," and that's from the Rig Veda text in the in the uh, Vedic uh, text. Go ahead, David. You had something to say? Well, uh, this is one of the reasons why they're able to get away with what they do. You know, uh, a believer will hear about. Um, manipulating the forces of the aether and this other guy talks about the prana and the vril and they think well it's all just a bunch of nutwhackers and they are but the what we're beginning to figure out or what we have have figured out and this is one of the most important dots we're connecting tonight that this is all the same thing and the way that they cloak what they do they'll call it uh different names and put it in different scenarios but while they're lying uh litton he put it or bulwer litton a buttweiler you know not rottweiler he's a buttweiler <laughs> but uh, see we told you about this name pronunciation thing we got going on here <laughs> but this is how they cloak what they do they use different names and different times well here it is this is just a novel but you see it's the same common thread and the same means to access this occult power. And we're figuring it out, we're exposing it, and by understanding what they're doing, we can combat this with the Word of God. And uh, it, it's really very plain. Once you just have this understanding that we're sharing with you this evening, this is a very important dot that we're connecting. It is an important dot, and, and the one, one thing that's really uh, important to note here is this energy that they are receiving from is an upside-down, twisted version of the energies that we receive from the Father, which is the Holy Spirit and His guidance through us and His ability, His power that has been given to us as believers. And there are people that that really take this and twist it the other way, but we, in, in this slide here that I have here, this, this talks about... Uh, well, I probably ought to show it to you guys, right? Well, it talks about the they having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And it'll say, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, this is an interesting one, this scripture right here, where it talks about people performing many miracles. Um, because they thought they were doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. They thought that that's where they're doing it, but we see this thing going on now in not only the church, but in a lot of different religions where they are pulling their power from different sources. We see yoga in the church, which I did on the shows Ancient Technologies. We talked about yoga and we talked about all these different things in the church pulling this false fire and pulling these false works and false uh, miracles that they're pulling into this and they thought they were doing this stuff in the name of the of the father they thought they were doing these miracles in, in the holy spirit uh, but in fact it's very uh, it's very possible that they were doing this through this seething power of lucifer i guess seething energy of lucifer yeah. instead yeah and the seething energy of uh, energies of lucifer is the vril is the vril yep and and all of these things blavatsky and Swinburne Clymer, the adepts of the mystery schools, they all equate it to vibrations. And over and over in the Word of God, it talks about the voice of God thundering. It thunders on a vibratory level that's very different than the vibrations of the vril and the eighth force. And when the voice of God thunders, we have to have 
the Spirit of God and our spirit to be able to decipher what God is saying to us. And it's a very profound passage in John chapter 12. Um, Yeshua said, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. You see, Yeshua could understand what the Father was saying. His receiver was working. The other people, their receiver wasn't working. They just heard thunder. So we have to have the Spirit of God in our human spirit to have the capacity to understand. The Scripture says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And for an unregenerate person, to try to understand the voice of God, this is like trying to listen to FM radio with an AM receiver. It's not going to work. It's a different vibration. No capacity there to receive. It'll just be noise. Exactly. And, you know, one of the, this is just some, a side note here. One of the concepts that they, that these people use, and this is really disturbing kind of right, right here, what we're going to talk about, but, uh, and we will get into the hollow earth. I know people are like, well, what was this hollow earth? This all ties in together because this is, this has to do with where, where they believe they're receiving this energy from the hollow earth, from the black sun and the earth and all these different things. But one of the ways that they attain some of this stuff is really disturbing because in our country that we live in people think this is not possible this is not happening but in, in this slide you see uh, human sacrifice child sacrifice and different things they believe that by doing these things they receive energy from these things and there's a quote by Aleister Crowley and I'll let you quote it David because you can quote it off the top of your head uh, Aleister Crowley talking about the perfect sacrifice for receiving energy yeah um, Crowley said that the perfect sacrifice was a male child of perfect innocence and the concept, and I know, John, we were talking before the show about the concept of adrenal chrome, and this is extracted from the adrenal gland, and one of the most valuable things to Satanist is the adrenal chrome from a sacrificed child. And in the occult concept, the drawing down, understanding that they believe they're drawing down the powers of the aether into this sacrificial victim and by exciting the poor victim and the innocent child to a, uh, a state of fear and terror, they amplify this into the adrenal glands and then they extract it for their perverse uh, purposes. And someone that was linked with the West Memphis Three, you were sharing with me in the new movie, Johnny Depp actually talks about adrenal chrome in this new movie. Yeah, and this isn't really a new movie, but I think it was in the 90s, but oh, okay. he was, he was uh, playing this reporter in this thing, he was going to this event, but in the whole time he's doing these drugs, and, and they talk about this drug called adrenal chrome, and his partner, I can't remember the guy's name, he says, this is like... Uh, it makes mescaline like ginger beer. Yeah. And he takes it and they're talking about, it. he's like, where did you get this? He said, I, I can't, I don't want to talk. I don't want to tell you. And I, some, you know, in so many words, I can't quote it word for word or anything, but he tells him this stuff. And then he said, you must have a dark source for this. And he said, a Satanist. And he's like, cause adrenal crumb only comes from one place. And uh, he said, it comes from the brain. It comes from adrenaline in the brain in the adrenal gland and so anyways there's this this thing they talk about there and, and you know something really crazy i saw the other day chrome the app google chrome has a plug-in called adreno which i thought was wow. really crazy and interesting <laughs> i just saw that the other day and it kind of blew my mind but there there's this power they believe in longevity uh through vampirism eating drinking of blood and through the sacrifice and all these different things so this all kind of plays into uh this this force that these people are doing. And that's why we see such a huge number of people in Hollywood and people in, in power. And for instance, I mean, this is a, a human trafficking is massive and it goes all the way up to the highest echelons of power in our world and uh, very interesting stuff. And so um, the Thule, Thule Society, did you have anything else to say? Well, before I, go I, well I just had the thought that even back in the Hermetic Mystery Schools, the god Hermes was associated with Mercury and the symbol of the caduceus. Mm. And this was the quicksilver of the witches and of the occult and the same basic uh, thing and the same basic concept. Yeah, and um, 
to kind of get into a little bit more about the Thule Society here. Um, so this was the Thule Society was a occultist and Bolshevik group founded in Munich right after World War One, and it was named after a mythological, myth, a mythical northern country and Greek legend. And uh, they sponsored the DAP, which was the German Worker Party, and was reorganized by Adolf Hitler. And according to Hitler biographer Ian Kershaw, uh, he said member lists were, you know, included Rudolf Hess, Alfred Rosenberg, Hans Frank, Julius Lehmann, Gottfried Feder, Dietrich Eckhart, and Karl Herr. And so you have these real prominent members. And in this picture here, you see Hitler with his hand hidden inside of his jacket here, which is a common ruler symbol where they have the hidden hand. Like uh, Napoleon. It, like Napoleon, like um, Churchill. Um, I mean, you've even seen, I've even seen pastors in, in uh, I can't remember, the Pat Robinson in a, in a magazine having the hidden hand symbol. And, and a lot of these people have this symbol here. And it's really interesting because you have this order, right? And this, the interesting part about it, um, I'm going to go to this next thing here. So the, and I could be pronouncing this wrong. I am not German and I don't claim to. Well, I hope you don't mispronounce it, John. I I I hope not either. It'd be the worst thing ever. So uh, German Nindorn, this is the best I can (laughs) pronounce this. Um, And it is in English, the order of Teutons. And the Thule Society was originally a German study group headed by Walter Niehaus. And uh, he was a wounded War One, one ve- World War One veteran who turned into an art student for Berlin, Berlin, who became the keeper of the pedigrees of the German Norden, the German Order, the Order of the Teutons, a secret society that was founded in 1911. So this was a order that basically he was the pedigree keeper. He was the the um, basic, uh, I guess, kind of like the uh, genealogist type person that um, would have been similar to Lawrence Gardner for the Scottish and for different people like that. He was this guy that did this stuff. And it's really interesting, David, and I don't know for sure that there is a tie in this. I'm assuming that there must be, and you see, you can see the runic symbols up there on the top, but there, there, there's a tie-in, I believe, to the Teutonic Knights. And most people may have never, well, some of you guys that listen to the show often have heard of the Teutonic Order, Teutonic Knights. Uh, but the Masters of the Teutonic Order. In this slide, it shows a bunch of the different symbols. We have the, like the Knights Templar, etc., that they played off of. But I wonder uh, this these Order of Teutons and the Teutonic Order how closely related they are. Well, they very much are. And basically, what we have going on here, the real society was an occult order, and there was a lady Maria of Ostrica. And here again, that's probably not the precise (laughs) pronunciation, but she was a very beautiful woman, and she was able to use her charms to get donations to fund the real experiments with uh, technology that she wanted to perform. And from the real society, there was a fellow by the name of Dietrich Eckhart, and he took the occult order into a secret society. And the Thule Society, and there was another secret society called the New Templars that very much saw themselves as the continuation of the Teutonic Knights and the Knights Templar that were this religious military order that were going to bring to power this German Messiah. And there was a fellow by the name of Guido von List who paved the way for this in his writings combining theopathy with German folklore. And he come up with the concept of the German Messiah. And of course, this was the role that Hitler stepped in to fill. And these groups, and in the real society, Karl Haushofer and Dietrich Eckhart both went on to be personal mentors of Hitler, and they saw him as this German Messiah, and this is how Hitler saw himself. So very much they saw themselves in much the way that the Knights Templar and the Knights Malta in the Catholic orders did. They were this military religious order that was going to bring in their German Messiah. And it's interesting, you know, this the swastika symbol that is used this is you know and nowadays people don't even they don't know their history they don't know where symbols come from they automatically assume that it means uh, nazi 
uh, racist or whatever, but these symbols date very far back. And I'm going to show you this. This is uh, in, in Buddhism. You see it. You see it in realism. Locally. You see in the Hopi, the Christian, the Malta, the Tibet, um, you know, China, Japan, Islamic, Hindu, Celt, Bali, Aztec, Japan, Greek, you know, Jewish, etc. You have these these symbols that keep popping up all over the place, okay? And it, it makes you really wonder where this come from. Of course, the theos- we saw that the theosophy symbol came from that. So here's a little bit of a background on, on the swastika. The name swastika comes from the Sanskrit, which takes us back again to the Vedic uh, text, and it said denotes the uh, conducive to well-being or auspicious. And, and that's if it's in clockwise, it's called the swastika, and it's the symbol of the sur- the surya or the sun, and it means prosperity and good luck. Why the counterclockwise, which is the one I believe Hitler used, um, is called the savastika, and I, I believe that's how you pronounce it. And that's probably how a German would pronounce that, and it symbolizes night or the tantric aspects of Kali. And for those of you that don't know who Kali is, Kali is the god. And if you watch Indiana Jones, you actually they give a pretty good history on who Kali is. But Kali yeah. is the god that has all the different arms. And she has the thuggies that worship her and go around and kill people for her. And this is where we get our term thugs nowadays from rappers. And, and it's actually interesting. I did a little bit of study on this. And a friend of mine um, took pictures of this, actually. But in the bottom of... Uh, the founder of one of the major record labels of in hip hop, he has a statue of this Kali, and mm-hmm. this this term thug is what a lot of rappers have coined for people that are going out, kind of doing their thing. And these thugs were their group of bandits that would go out and kill people and bring you know rob people and do all these different things. But anyways, this this Kali is a, a goddess of, of evil goddess that kills people, just really wicked. And this is where this this symbol uh, comes from, and. This is interesting because the technologies, right? We talked about this before when, when I was doing the show on the Ancient Watchers. These technologies from the Vedic texts were... Um, like the Vedic texts originally were compiled by the Aryans. This is before the Hindus yeah. used it, the Indians used it. They were compiled by the Aryans. And this symbol comes from that. And so the, Hitler was obsessed with actually pulling from these uh, pulling these technologies and searching the world for different things. And this is a... this this slide right here shows ufos with uh or or you know flying saucers with um hitler behind and these are actual some of these are actual pictures of what you would see and then we have the spear of destiny and then we have this hollow earth idea on here and you have this stuff they they were obsessed with looking for these things you don't you can be an ignorant person and you and there's probably going to be people they never were anybody that can look into history can really just see this and it it doesn't take a, a genius to know that they were obsessed with looking for these artifacts and excess of looking for these places and, and obsessed with pulling the energy from this black sun or from this this vril or from whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and they believed that this power was coming from the heart of the earth, just like in Lighten's novel. And the reason why uh, when the Allies went into Berlin, they found a thousand Tibetan monks in German uniforms, and they were all out there dead. Uh, apparently from a mass suicide, and it was Karl Hossover who was in the Vril Society and also in the Thule Society, a personal mentor to Hitler, and he taught at the University of Munich, and he was the driving force behind the Ahan, the Aharambe, which was this branch of Nazism that would track down uh, these artifacts all over the world, and Hossover uh, instigated this uh, mission to Tibet because they understood that the vril and the prana was the same thing and that it had these religious connotations. And there is an admission. Uh, there was a German rocket scientist called Willie Lay, and he came to America in 1935, and he admitted that the whole theory behind the German rocketry and aircraft program was the Vril. So they understood it was religious, and they uh, they understood it was coming from fallen powers within the heart of the earth. And this was their goal, that there was nothing that the Nazis did in action or in symbol that was not tied to the occult and this understanding of the Vril. 
And that that ties into a little bit of you know brings the memory of Jack Parsons to mind. You oh, know, yeah. somebody that they did this this working. Um, it wasn't the Babylon working. It was it wasn't it was the Babylon working yeah. that they did where they um, did this magic ritual uh, where Elron Hubbard was actually involved. And, and Jack Parsons is known as like the father of of American rocketry. You know, he it's it's really crazy how it all ties in. But they claim to pull this power. Uh, from this stuff, and it just kind of the list goes on. I mean, the, the more we bring up, the more I can think of all these different yeah. people that are tapping into this stuff. And L. Ron Hubbard was another yeah. novelist that started his own religion based on these very same occult principles. Yep. Another name, Scientology. Well, it's not another thing, it's just the same old thing. Exactly. It's just the same old thing, repackaged and reordered here. So when we get into the idea, I guess, about the hollow earth. And so we'll get into this idea and there's a lot of different concepts on how this is taking place. And I don't think anybody really knows exactly how it works unless they've been there themselves. And, but you see these, these concepts, you have this central sun inside of Argatha, which, uh, according to some people, Admiral bird, according to, uh, whether or not you believe that this journal wasn't ta- you know, tampered with that he went through, through the <coughs> North pole and he went through into this place and you have the central sun, you have the city, that goes that you have in there and you have ufos that come in and out of it um and this is the first down at the bottom right you see this uh, satellite photo uh that supposedly shows the first photos of the hole at the pole now depending on your worldview of the earth which my view of the earth comes from the scripture i believe that we are living on a uh a enclosed system with a um with a um dome around us and we have a underground underneath us we have a hollow earth the bible talks about a bottomless pit it talks about sheol it talks about all these different things but we have this they became obsessed with this idea and they believed it was inhabited uh according to the real book it talks about this too he fell through the cracks and he saw these these race of people that were superior to humans and that also there talks about reptilian type creatures in in certain books that talk about these things and that you know they were really obsessed with going to Antarctica and they they actually went there and they had this place uh, that they called um, New Schwabia and uh, New Schwabenland and it's the given to an area and you can see the area there I've got the coordinates on there for you where they claim this place is and it's really interesting because when we look at their obsession with that they actually went and visited with a group of people uh, that we know them as Tibetan Tibetan monks and all these different people that believed in this stuff as well. They had a concept where it's called Shambhala. And in Shambhala, it's an uh, ancient text where they have various traditions that mentions beings from another world that exist within our own. And in Tibetan Buddhists, like I said, in Hindu traditions, it's Shambhala. And it's the hidden kingdom within our own planet and a place that we don't necessarily understand here. And so that you see here on the right here, you have this picture depicted of the Shambhala. And then on the left, you see these Nazis meeting with these Tibetan monks up here on the left. And you have this this expedition that they made and, and talked to these different people, which is very interesting because, um, you know, in the scripture, in the scripture, we have an idea, a concept of this the earth. And this is the one done by Logos Bible Software. And this is what the earth is actually described as. And you can see that Sheol, we have this great deep. We have the foundations of the earth. We have this pit inside of the earth. And then we have this waters above the firmament in our sky. And this is what I believe we're looking at. And of course, there's people that would not believe this map. They would believe that the earth is a globe and and there's somehow this bottomless pit inside this uh, sphere, which to me doesn't necessarily make sense. I don't believe we know exactly how the earth looks because the Bible says it's unable to be measured. I believe that there is aspects of it that we have no clue. We only know what we're told about it in scripture and this is what we're told about it. So it's really interesting, but we have this pit and we have these things mentioned in in the Bible. We have in Ephesians 4, 9 through 10, it says, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And Revelation speaks of a bottomless pit that the destroyer will come out of. And it talks about these the pit with these locusts will come out of and these uh, spirits that look like frogs. And uh, there's, there's definitely a biblical concept. And also, if you read the book of Enoch, the first book of Enoch, the only one I endorse, 
you will see this concept of these angelic beings that are actually chained in this earth being. And I believe these are the beings that they were going after. They were looking for these beings to gain more knowledge, uh, to learn how to tap into the force better, to live longer, to live forever. And do you have anything to say, David, before I go on to the next one? Well, it's very biblical. Amos 9 and 1, it says, though they dig into hell, Shoal. And it was pictured literally as in the heart of the earth. And in the book of Jubilees, chapter 9, there's the fascinating passage where there are 90% of the Nephilim spirits that are confined to the underworld, while 10% are left here in the first heaven with us. So there is much scriptural foundation for uh, powerful spiritual dark forces being in the underworld. It's very biblical very biblical and it, and it really i believe is very logical that that they knew, they knew about this they knew about this place not only from the scriptures but they knew about it from the vedic text they knew about mm-hmm. it from this real book they knew about it from every ancient source that's out there not only did they know about it from the sources they tapped into it you know when you've got guys like tesla that are inventing things that are well beyond our understanding giving credence to this when you got people that like this automobile manufacturer they're giving credence to this thieves indian mathematicians that are giving credence to this Oppenheimer that's giving credence jack parsons all these different people there's proof i believe at a certain i mean i don't know this evidence there's enough evidence to convict in my opinion uh that this is actually uh how it is and you know they believe this so much there's operation high jump and i don't know how many of you guys are familiar with operation high jump but in operation high jump um it was a, a title by the United States Navy uh, and our Antarctic Developments Program, and it was done in 1946 to 1947, and it was organized by Admiral Byrd, which is where a lot of this hollow earth theory, the people get their journal, and I don't believe you have to go to Admiral Byrd necessarily for the journal of this place, and I don't know how much of it he tapped into, how much, he, how much of the journals are corrupted or not, but it's interesting, but they had this thing that commenced on the 22nd of 1946 and ended in February 1947, and uh, it had 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts that were associated with this, a big operation, and um, they were the official reason was to establish a military base on this, on this thing, and then, you know, what I believe personally about this is I believe that they were trying to jump over the ice walls or they're trying to get over a certain part of this that maybe they couldn't get over. And I don't know exactly what was going on, but it's an interesting concept. I mean, not too long after that you have was, I guess, about 20 years after that, you have op- uh, Operation Fishbowl where they sent nuclear weapons up into the sky uh, as high as they could go to explode and, and create this kind of a fishbowl phenomenon looking thing that's really interesting. I mean, you have... Uh, I looked at all the list of people that had explored the Antarctic. There are people that liter- that went there, and they believe that there's this hole that we're talking about here. This is where the northern lights comes out of this aura. In the Book of Enoch, it talks about this mountain or whatever that this these lights are coming out of, and they're actually angels that are coming that can be as men. And all. It's, it's just really interesting how it all ties in together. You got anything to add to that, David? Well, I believe one of the reasons why there are so many lies about biblical cosmology is that they don't want scientists to figure out the real secrets to the power. They want them for themselves. And I believe when the Nazis, it's a well-established fact that the Nazis went to Antarctica in 1938 before Hitler uh, came to power right during his initial rise, and they established a base there. And I believe that these guys, whatever you think about them, they were very, very smart guys, and they were making their plan B. If their little World War II experiment didn't go right, this was their escape plan. And it's also a well-documented fact that there were over 40 of these huge U-boats, and there was a German uh, attack submarine that we're most familiar with, but there was also a huge underwater transport that could hold over 400 tons of material, and over 40 of these were never accounted for as being captured or destroyed. And I believe it's very plausible and all too obvious that this is where the elite of the Nazis that were never found, they made their escape to. And the fact that uh, history tells us that Eva Braun and Hitler died in a bunker in Berlin. I just don't believe it. Not going for that one. 
Yeah, and it's it's interesting because we have Operation Paperclip, which I, I have a. That this is not where I was wanting to go just yet with it because I I think I've got my stuff all kind of mixed up here. But there's a show here. I'm gonna transition over here. There's a show called Hunting Hitler, and this is led by uh, Robert Booker Bear, and he's an Amer- he's an author and he was a CIA case officer who was assigned to the Middle East, and they went and traced these CIA documents, these FBI documents that the CIA, FBI, and M- M15, they absolutely knew that Hitler had not died. They knew where he was for part of the time. And this these documents prove it. These are documents that they've released to the public for everybody to look. It's a really cool documentary on History Channel. I think you could, if, you have, if you don't have History Channel or whatever and you wanted to watch it, you could probably find it to buy the series. But I would suggest looking at it. But I agree with you. They had these, these submarines that they proved actually went there i think they actually found one uh in the bottom in season two they you know they went through these sources and located escape routes and and stuff like that but i this kind of goes into uh david about what we're talking about operation paperclip so operation paperclip um we have this interesting thing where these hundreds of scientists these nazi scientists were actually hired on by our own government hired on to um Take the reins, I guess, for technologies and to, to move forward. I mean, we had already in America, we had people that supported uh, the Nazi regime like Ford and the Bushes, the Bush families, all these different things. They really supported the Nazi regime. And we've been made to think that this was some crazy uh, racist organization, which they, they were to a certain extent. But they're also uh, the same people that run our country. You know, these are the same people that... <laughs> that are um, scientists in our country, the same people that are leaders in our country, they believe this stuff as well. They believe that whatever these people believe, they believe it as well. They, they're on the race to technology. They're moving towards They're moving towards making us a better people. You have talked about people raising their chakras, raising their energies, and raising these things. This is a, this is a real thing. And I, in my opinion, when you look at stuff like this, you look at these this group of men. These are all Nazi scientists that were brought over and you look at the idea that the CIA, MI5, uh, FBI, they all knew where Hitler was. They all knew he was alive after that. They all knew it. And they, and these people that hunting Hitler actually went to these places and proved these compounds were there that they found. Um, they knew it. And, and you have just Warner Von Braun, for instance, the, the guy that started NASA, the, the brains behind the operation that won awards and all these different things. This guy was a Nazi scientist that started this organization. And we have stuff like this over and over and over again. We see it. And I don't know how blind you have to be to not think, well, maybe there's something more to this story than what we hear. Because you have to remember, history is written by the winners. It's written written by the people that have the power. It's written by the people that are can take over and do the things they want. They can say what we want. The more I study history, David, I don't know if it's like that with you, the more I realize it's very veiled and you have to really dig to find out the truth. And even if you can find out the truth because they've written, they've hidden other stuff, it's it's pretty intense. And you've got these huge events like the death of Hitler, 9-11, Kennedy assassination. We're not getting the truth about it. And if you look at it, uh, any of these conspiracies – it's obvious that we're not getting the truth. And all the way back in the 70s, there was a movie with Gregory Peck in it called The Boys from Brazil. And this was the whole scenario of this, the uh, hunting down of well-documented of these um, Germans that went, many of them, to Argentina. Mm -hmm. And there was actually, after the war was over, there was a German submarine that was had to dock in... uh, Argentina because it was having mechanical problems and it was obviously on its way uh, to Antarctica. And there's another documentary on Netflix about all of the twins in this certain area in South America. And it's a well-established fact. The Nazis were there. Yeah, Mengele was actually, yeah. yeah. Mengele was there, and yeah. many of the most elite Nazis, they were right there in South America. Well-established fact. So, you know, only the people, and it's also a well-established fact that the FBI certainly believed that Hitler did not die in the bunker, and they actively pursued Hitler for several years after the war. 
and they certainly didn't believe the Hitler died in a bunker story. It's a well-documented fact, and facts are ugly things for people that want to close their eyes to the truth. This is a this is a group called Realism. Uh, Realism, or the Realian Movement, is a UFO cult that was founded in 1974 by Claude Vurihan, and he was also known as Rael. And so this is interesting. People are, you know, think of this guy or whatever. We had a guy, I believe his name was Eddie, that was on the show before that was actually a member of this cult at one time. But we see this symbolism, this Nazi symbolism in there. And the the uh, Rillians, they actually um, founded this group, okay, this, uh, this company called Clonade. And if you look here, this is their advertisements. This is a clonate dream team, it says over here. And it's got the neurobiology. They got PhDs in neurobiology, PhDs in neuroscience, uh, general protect- practitioners. They got bio biotechnologies, people, PhDs in that. They've got uh, PhDs in physical chemistry. And this is a group called Clonade that they actually uh, say that they clone human beings. And you look at their symbols here. Uh, if you look on their website, there's they're all over the world. They're in different places, but they have um, they have this thing going on within the Raelian movement. And recently, I saw this uh, video, and I'm going to transition over to this real quick here. Uh, there's this video, and I can't play the video. I wanted to play it because I had to test it out because last time I did a video, I did talked about Jim Carrey in the video, and I talked about how he was talking about summoning these entities to talk and they cut the video out so I look stupid. I'm sitting here talking about this video I'm getting ready to play and then on the <laughs> on the actual recorded video it's not there. So I'm gonna show a picture of the guy instead because I did test it out to see and it's definitely banned almost everywhere except for the people that showed the interview and I believe it was called like Vlad T V or Vlad or I can't remember some group. But if you look up this guy, you'll see his name's Kid Boo. Or Kid Boo Boo I have no <laughs> nowadays these rappers look completely nuts but if you look on his chest in the middle in that um right there he has the Raelian symbol in the middle of his chest there's a video recently where he talks about he is the second generation clone of this person and his first generation clone actually uh died and they sent his skull to the Raelian mo- movement to clone aid and they took this piece out where he's got that tattoo in the front that holds all their memories and that's where they take that piece out so that they can clone them and they can still transfer their memories over to these people but he talks about being cloned escaping from the cloning facility he talks about uh the immortality behind this stuff real really into a lot of this movement and cloning is an interesting concept an interesting thing that we have here because we we have this you know this concept to live forever we have this concept of tapping into this energy source that makes us just so smart um and this is the same deception the same temptation that adam and eve received in the garden this temptation to become as gods live forever to have this knowledge and um this is one of the groups. There's a lot of different groups. We could have gone. A, I could have gone a lot of different ways with all this stuff, and really to be able to pack everything into one show is going to be nearly impossible. But I know you did a little bit of research on some of this cloning idea and some of these interesting creatures that have to do with the eyes entering the eyes and all these things, David. So I'm going to pass it over to you for a second if you want to talk about that. All righty. Um, the Vril is talked about as being an actual reptilian creature and theoretically the nazis claimed that their scientific revelations of their saucer designs and rocketry designs came from the occult powers from the real society now it's very theoretically possible that people that are today in the contact with the same powers that they are the propagators of this black science and one of the this areas is cloning and what they call droning and droning is what they claim is the entry of the vril reptilian creature into the eye and this allows the vril to take over the body now there are multiple people that have testified that they have been uh, violated by these vril creatures through the eye socket now there's actually a biblical foundation for this Um, in scripture 
uh, in Matthew. I'll just go and read the scripture uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and uh, verse 23. And it's something that Yeshua said. And this is so profound when you begin to read this in this context. And this is not a context that has just emerged um, in our in our time. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 23, my flipper isn't too quick tonight, but Matthew <laughs> six twenty-three. but if thine eye be evil, Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. That word for evil in the Greek, in the Septuagint, this is used for the noisome beast that the Father said he would send upon uh, Israel if they did not uh, keep covenant and obey his Torah. And it's also interesting that this word uh, in the Hellenistic period, in the theological dictionary of the New Testament, this word that Yeshua used for evil and associated it with the eye, this was in the Hellenistic period associated with wild beasts of magic who unsettles marriage or snatches away the blushing maidens. And it's just so fascinating that in the Vril uh, novel, the power came from within the earth from a black sun. This would, was carried over by the order of the black sun from uh, Heinrich Himmler and the Willisburg Castle where they had the black sun there in the middle of uh, the floor and they channeled this Vril energy. And this uh, area where this came forth was the black forest, the black sun, the area of the black forest, and there was actually a real saucer that crashed in the black forest in 1936. There were articles written about it. Um, it's a matter of public record, and this is also the very same area that uh, in the University of Munich that gave rise to the real society, Hitler, some of his biggest rallies. This is also the area in Bavaria that gave rise to the Bavarian Illuminati. And Adam Weissoff talked about the fire worship in the Illuminati. Same exact thing as this real force. And there has been a powerful territorial devil that has worked in this area of Bavaria that has caused two world wars. It has unleashed the connection between uh, the occult world and science and brought it into our time in a way that is unprecedented. And I believe that it's very possible that when the Nazis established their base in Antarctica, that much of the new world order is run at this very hour from uh, the real command central, not from the White House or the Kremlin, but in these underground bases in Antarctica where they are still making contact with giant angels chained in the hollow earth. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Puritan Barn and the Midnight Ride. It is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's broadcast. And tonight we're going to be examining the oldest pagan worship site on earth. Our broadcast is entitled The Giants of Baalbek, and it's going to be a very, very compelling ride i guarantee you so get ready it all starts right now because we are now live 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 what's up guys once again we're here like david said in the puritan barn ready to just do the best that we can to give you guys information that is very valid very important and at the same time super interesting and you know for those of us that are interested in our ancient history and our ancient past and 
being able to decode these things is just an amazing thing that I'm thankful and grateful for. So wherever you guys are listening from, if you're listening live or if you're listening after this video is done, let us know where you guys are. Uh, we, we love you guys. With that being said, David, I think people are ready to hear about these crazy giants um, and the history behind all this and where this came from and, and all of that. So I'm excited anyway. I know that. All right. Well, we'll get going. We're going to be looking at Baalback, and I know many of you are familiar with Baalback, and we're going to be giving out some of the amazing history of it. And then we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about Baalback. And I know people will say, well, Baalback isn't in the Bible, and the word Baalback is not. But when we study this site, we will be finding out other names that Baalback has been known by, and they are in the Bible. So we can use scripture to trace the history of this site. And this goes all the way back to Cain or even older, in my opinion. This is the, uh, I will call this the oldest pagan worship site on earth. So we're going to begin by giving you some basic information about Baalback. We have a little video here and we'll be showing you some other slides to just uh, show just what we're talking about here. So we're here at Baalbek. This is the famous quarry, which is just about less than a kilometer from the main Baalbek site. Behind me is the Stone of the South, or the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, it's also called. And just beneath that, over that side, is the 1,650 ton stone that was found and rediscovered and dug out in 2014. So this is really rewriting the history of the planet here because people like Graham Hancock and other researchers suggest these are pre-Roman, these are ancient sites, there's even legends that state this was built by a Cain who was uh, you know, linked with the patriarchs of the Bible going back many, many thousands of years and it was peopled and built by giants connected with Cain. There's also stories about Kronos and the Titans being involved in this and there's other stories of giants like the Nephilim being involved. There's so much going on here with the prehistory with the local folklore and traditions that have been recorded for the last couple of hundred years. And, you know, if the Romans did build this site, did build Baalbek completely, including the platform, why didn't they reuse this? Was this completely buried in sand and dirt? Why wasn't it reused? It's just, it's just too incredible. This is, oh, this is roughly a thousand tons, more or less exactly, just a fraction over a thousand tons, this one. We're going to go and look at the other quarry which has got uh, an unnamed stone, which is about 1,240 tons, but it's the 1,650 ton one. That's the really interesting one, combined with the whole mythology and stories, which we'll get more into when we go to the other quarries and we go to the Baalbek temple itself. So we're just looking at the Stone of the South, also called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. You can also see a mound kind of up behind. You know, what can you say, but wow. I mean, this today, that you know, and so, the, the story from history is the Romans handled those stones. But Graham Hancock, who we're going to have some quotes from here in just a moment. I mean, with the Romans could not have done this. This was beyond their capability. Today, with all the modern equipment, 1,650 ton stone, we could not do anything with it. I don't think there's any way that you can rationalize that this is anything but 
something that had to have some supernatural or giant assistance to it. There's just no other way to explain this, in my opinion. And um, I would tend to believe that this is the work of the Nephilim, and this is the local uh, legends and the stories about Baalbek. The people there around there for years and centuries have believed that these were the work of the ancient giants. And when you look at the size of the stones here, that would be the logical conclusion you'd come to if you didn't know anything about anything. This has been for thousands of years a pagan worship site. There have been various different pagan temples built here. This is the ruin of the Temple of the Muses that was there, one of the temple. And the Muses, these were the feminine devils that were the inspiration of music and art and things like that. That's where we get our word music. In this other temple here, in this next slide, we see the temple of Bacchus. And Bacchus was worshipped in Roman times, and it was worshipped with all kinds of orgiastic and uh, uh, licentious behavior. And uh, another temple here is the temple of Venus. And Venus, we know from Isaiah 14, that Lucifer was worshipped as the planet Venus. And we're going to see here that the worship of the uh, host of heaven has been a part of this all the way back as far as paganism goes. We're going to see that Jupiter was worshipped here. We're going to see also that Venus was. And here in the, this last slide, there is the temple of Jupiter. And this is a the most amazing to me, this is one of the most amazing places on earth. If I would have a bucket list, this would be one of the places yeah. that I would like to see because it's just absolutely phenomenal. But the paganism that has been put forth here, we're looking really at ground zero of the satanic uh, uh, arsenal. And where we're located here, we are 35 miles from Damascus. And if you go to the on, on the northern boundary of Israel, we have Mount Hermon, and this is where the, the, the book of Enoch says in chapter 6 that the 200 watchers came down. And right at the base of Mount Hermon, going off to the, uh, it would be the, the southwest corner, there is a valley that goes down right into Baalbek. And we're going to be giving you the history of this area and how important it is. This area has been supremely important, and it is the, the place where Satan has launched his attack on the people of God for a long, long time, and it continues to this day. Now, Graham Hancock in this book, The Magician of the Gods, and as was mentioned in the video we played, Mr. Hancock has argued that because of the nature of just the huge size of these stones, the way that we, they were moved and used in construction, that they have to be pre-Roman. And I think that's just an obvious conclusion. But Mr. Hancock makes other connections here, and he says this is on page 255 of his book. He says, Freemasons who have studied the Temple of Bacchus point to a number of reliefs and designs here that are meaningful to them. For example, on the underside of a huge ceiling block, still balanced on the columns of the temple, appears the device known as the Seal of Solomon, a six-pointed star inscribed within a circle. According to leading U.S. Freemason Timothy Hogan, Grand Master of the Knights Templar Order, the figure in the center of the star is depicted giving a sign that would be familiar to entered apprentices and this is showing that freemasonry is the propagator of the most ancient forms of paganism they have taken these luciferian rites and this star of the six-pointed star we've talked about this a lot in scripture it's called the star of rim fan and people today they want to call this the Star of David, and they want to turn it into something godly, but it is not. This is the Star of Remphan, 
and we can find this in the most ancient of pagan temples. And as we go forward, we're going to see the association of this area with Solomon, with the seal of Solomon, with the darkest black magic, and of the absolute ruin. Well, not the absolute ruin. Israel is not ruined. The Israel of God is alive and well. But we're going to show the role that this area played in the, the apostasy of the nation of Israel. And we know there's a lot of times, John, when we have tried to point this out, that that seal of Solomon, it's not a godly thing. People want to get all bent out of shape about it, but it's a fact. It's just an absolute fact. It really is, and it's so it's so hard to convince people that because they've been so accustomed to seeing that, and they're like, oh, how can a whole nation be wrong about this not being that? But you will never find a place in the Bible that mentions the Star of David. Uh, like you said, yeah. you'll, you'll find the Star of Moloch, Star of Rimfan, you'll find that but definitely not the Star of David. And I think we proved in one episode that exactly what that Star of Rimfan and the Star of uh, Moloch are. You know, it's the five and six-pointed stars. Yeah. So. And that was the opinion of the Father, that yeah. the whole nation went wrong and he judged them. Yeah. And uh, it would be good for us all to pay attention. Now, Baalbek plays huge in the uh, narrative of the ancient alien. And Zechariah Sitchkin was one of the biggest voices in the ancient uh, alien narrative. And according to those, Baalbek was built by people from other planets. They came down here, the ancient alien narrative that people on Earth were created by aliens and uh, they're going to come back and, you know, the Space Brothers are going to save us and that whole narrative. And we could certainly have some false narratives of that play out. We better... Uh, hold on and uh, take notice. We talked about a few of those scenarios in the Melchizedek Midnight Ride. But this is what Mr. Sitchkin said in his book, The Stairway to Heaven. He says the spaceport and the landing place at Baalbek lay on the perimeter of an inner circle, forming a vital team of installations that were equidistant from the control center in Jerusalem. So according to Mr. Sitchkin, we've got a bunch of spaceports here for the Anunnaki landing ships. And if you just do away with the uh, spaceman genre and just replace the fallen angels and the giants, we have a pretty good picture of what is going on here. Now, when we begin to unpack what the Bible has to say about Baalbek, we, we can begin to do that when we understand the other names that Baalbek has been known down through history. And this has been here way back. You know, I think it goes all the way back to the fall of man. Now, this is the McClintock and Strong. It's the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. And that is the same James Strong of Strong's Concordance fame. And I'm going to use this as a, a source to unpack the ancient names of Baalbek, and we're going to go to Scripture, and we're going to see the history of it, and not only the history of Baalbek, but the spiritual impact it had upon Israel, and the spiritual impact it has to this day upon the world. Now, in uh, this cyclopedia by McClintock and Strong, it says this. He says, Baal Gad is not unfavorable to the conclusion which some have reached that it is no other than the place which from a temple consecrated to the sun that stood there was by the Greeks called Heliopolis, a city of the sun, and which the natives call and still call Baalbek, a word apparently of the same meaning. And as this work states, for many years, Baalbek was known as Heliopolis, named after the city of the sun and the pagan worship center in Egypt. And it was also known in scripture as Baal Gad. So when we go to the word of God and we found out what the scripture says about Baal Gad, we're going to get a real historical his and spiritual picture of just what's going on here. Now, let's go to the scripture. And we're going to read in Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. And we remember when we read Baal Gad, we're talking about Baal Beck. So Joshua took all that land 
the hills and all the south country and all the lands of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of Israel and the valley of the same, even from Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad, there's our word, that's Baalbek, even unto Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them. Joshua made a long time, made war a long time with all those kings. And scripture tells us that there was a great slaughter here where Joshua put to death many of these pagan kings here at Baalbek. And in verse 14, this gives us the extremity of the situation. This was an absolute total smackdown. This was Nephilim extermination 101. This was the heart of the heart of the of the deal here in Joshua 11 and 14 and all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them neither left they any to breathe if they breathed they were dead this was the highest infestation of Nephilim blood this was ground zero, and people that do not understand the Genesis 6 narrative of the sons of God and the daughters of men, and we're speaking of that, which the Bible tells us in Genesis 6, that fallen angels inbred with human women, and they produced these giants. They were called the mighty men of old, the Gibberim, the Nephilim, the Rephaim, and there's just so much in the Word of God about giants. And when you go to secular history, they just don't exist. This is just put into fairy tale land. And to even begin to have serious consideration by secular historians that Baalbek might have been built by giants is just not going to happen. Now, in Joshua 13 and 1, it says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. And in the, in the next verse here, in verse 5, this shows us that the land that we are talking about that runs from Damascus down southwest 35 miles, we're going to show you these valleys. And they go from there down to Baalbek. It says, And the land of the Gibe Giblites and all Lebanon toward the sun rising from Baal Ged, that's Baalbek, under Mount Hermon, unto the entering into Hamath. And this area was never taken. Joshua had a great slaughter here. He slaughtered many kings, but this land was never possessed. And this continued to be a great stumbling block unto Israel. And uh, it, it caused, and we're, we're going to see the tremendous damage it done because they did not go in and possess that. Now again, from McClintock and Strong, it says here on page 584, it says the modern representative of Baal Gad is Benias, a place which long maintained a great reputation as a sanctuary of Pan, see Carceria Philippi. And this is the place in Scripture where Jesus said this very thing. Now we're talking about at the very bottom, at, at, at Mount Hermon, on top of it, where the fallen angels come down, you can see the lights of Damascus from the top of Mount Hermon. 35 miles to the southwest, we have Baalbek. Right at the bottom of Mount Hermon, on the left side, the tribe of Dan had their, their inheritance. They, You can read in the Bible, they went totally full-blown into idolatry. And many of the early fathers believed that the beast of Revelation 13 would come from the tribe of Dan. And there's something to be said for that. Down to the center and to the right was the inheritance of Manasseh. And Manasseh, Ephraim shared with Manasseh in the early part of the conquest until they got their own allotment farther to the south. But right here at the base of Mount Hermon, as this valley goes down into Baalbek, this area that was never taken, Jesus said these words, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we're going to show you here a picture of the very spot where Jesus said this. And this word, Banias, it was a word that was synonymous with Baalbek. And this is the very place to this day uh, where this cave is that they still claim is the gate to hell. And I would not argue with them because this place, it is evil. This is uh, portal number one. There's a lot of portals, but this would be portal number one on, uh, on earth right here, the actual cave of Pan. Interesting, man. I know you're going to get into Pan, but what a, you know, it's, it, it's amazing when you really look at Pan, how, how much it affects the whole world we live in, that, just that word. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the old Baphomet goat, of course, is a prototype of the god Pan. Now, this is also interesting. This is a drawing of another temple that they had at Baalbek, and they called it the Temple of the Dancing Goats. Now, there was a relationship, and of course, Egypt looms large in the transmission of the mystery religions and idolatry, and Heliopolis, the worship center with all of the obelisk in Egypt, Baalbek was called Heliopolis also, and both mean uh, the city of the sun, where the sun and the heavenly luminaries were worshipped. Here in Baalbek, they had a temple to Venus, a temple to Jupiter, and also they had this temple of the dancing goats. Now, isn't that nice? And of course, in Freemasonry and also in the Odd Fellows, they talk about riding that goat. And the goat of Mendez is from Mendez, Egypt. And, and there, the goats did more than dance. I'll just leave it at that. But there were open public rites of bestiality that were carried on there at Mendez, Egypt. And the goat of Mendez, of course, this was drawn as the Baphomet by free mason Olympus levi and this is to this day the high icon of of satanism and the occult now this is a book and we've already mentioned the six-pointed star which masonic authorities have confirmed that this is something that is very masonic and you see it's not that, and well, Freemasonry, they claim their first grand master was Nimrod, but we're seeing that in the Indiana Monitor, it speaks of Freemasonry as a reservoir into which occult lore from many eons have poured its resources. And that's what it is. Freemasonry is a hodgepodge of Luciferian paganism from the Egyptian and Babylonian mysteries and it is nothing but an absolute occult mess. But in this teaching, Mr. Hall makes this statement. He says, Great Pan did not die. Freemasonry is the proof of his survival. And what else can you say? They are proud to be, and they claim to be the modern expressions of the pagan mysteries that have fought against the Israel of God, even long before the time of Christ. They brag about Freemasonry being the perpetuating the worship of the god Pan, just like in this ancient temple here at Baalbek. Now, this is the picture that is reproduced in the secret teachings of all ages, and this is the drawing of Pan. Now, where Mr. Hall got this from was from the Jesuit scholar Athanathius Kircher. And I found out when I started reading Athanathius Kircher just how much Manly P. Hall drew from Kircher when he wrote and drew his titles. But, I mean, look at this. I mean, this is just disgusting. And this is the great god Pan who Freemasonry is so proud to perpetuate its survival. And the worship of these ancient creatures, and of course this is also uh, the satire, it goes back to the fallen ones of the inbreeding of the half-human, half goat satires that we read about in Freemasonry. I mean, and there's just, uh, you know, what can you say about it? They own it. You know, they don't run from it, they own it. And look at like look at that shepherd staff too. You know that's interesting to me. You know it talks about the idle shepherd. It talks about the evil shepherd in the Bible, and his right eye being darkened. But it, that staff tells me a lot. You know this is this is literally the 
shepherd of the evil, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all, all the movies that you see pan in, all the children's movies and um, all of that, it just makes you wonder what are they, what are they getting at here? And the pan flute. You know, yeah. the God Pan would play his flute and the children would follow along. Yeah. Peter Pan, all of it. And the defilement of children is so much connected with this. We're going to also, before we're done, we're going to connect these series of valleys with the Valley of Gehenna, where the little children were sacrificed to Moloch. And um, it is just an, it's an ugly, ugly picture. And understanding the geography here, it's going to help us understand a lot of things now strong and mcclintock also have this to say about Baalbek. it says the largest stones okay let me see get my right page here 583 all right it says they are says richter the largest stones i have ever seen and might of themselves have easily been given rise to the popular opinion that Baalbek was built by angels at the command of Solomon. Now, this is also one of the most ancient occult traditions that the stones that you looked at there were built by Solomon with magic control of angels. Now, myself, I believe it's older. I think it goes back, but I think that that has a lot to do with it. And we're going to show that this is the very place where Solomon built his house, where he went totally south. I mean, he went totally south. Just Now, there's a writing here that I'm going to refer to and read a little bit from. Uh, this is reproduced in the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha by James Charlesworth, and it's called the Testament of Solomon. Now, the Testament of Solomon is a spiritually toxic book. It is a dark text, and we're reading it for the purpose of confirming the demonic influence that comes from this very place. And in the Testament of Solomon, Solomon, with a seal and a ring, controls demons. And he controls these demons to do building projects for him. And this is the very thing that was referred to in Strong and McClintock of this ancient legend that Solomon, through controlling devils and uh, all kinds of occult beings, built these stones. Now, in this book, The Testament of Solomon, it talks about Solomon controlling a winged dragon. It talks about Solomon controlling a three-headed dragon spirit. Uh, it talks about all kinds of the whole Genesis 6 scenario of these dragons uh, cohabitating with human women. And just a little bit of it in uh, chapter 2. When I heard these things, I, Solomon, got up from my throne and saw the demon shuddering and trembling with fear. I said to him, Who are you? What is your name? The demon replied, I am Ornias. And it goes on, and Solomon would one by one ask the devils, Well, what angel thwarts you? And then he would thwart the demon and have them go to work for him. Now, it says here, After I sealed the demon with my seal, I ordered him to the stone quarry to cut for the temple stones which had been transported by way of the Arabian Sea and dumped along the seashore. Now, here we go again. The seal of Solomon is the six-pointed star, and the seal of Solomon is one of the most powerful black magic sigils, and this seal was on the Temple of Jupiter right there in Baalbek. And according to this ancient text, and according to confirm the ancient legend, that Solomon built these building projects with the help of devils. Now, I will say this, the temple was built and ordained by God. That was something that God ordained to build the temple. But we're going to see here, as we get into the scripture, that there was some things that went wrong between the building of the temple and when Solomon built his house here. And we're going to see here, and I'll confirm it here, with a text here from McClintock. Now, here, under the article of Baalbek in Strong and McClintock, it says this, 
and this will enable us to open up a whole other area of research. It says Baalbek, a city of Kole, Syria, and supposed by many to be the site designated by Solomon's famous House of the Forest of Lebanon, 1 Kings 7, 1 Kings 10, 2 Chronicles 9. Now, Solomon built his house at Baalbek, and we've got a lot of information on that, and you might ask, well, why did he do that? And there was an attraction for some reason of Solomon to this area. And the, to this day, the seal of Solomon and the black magic uh, uh, grimoires that bear the name of Solomon, they are the most powerful black magic grimoires in existence. Now, let's read some scripture. Now understanding that Solomon's house was built here at Baalbek. 1 Kings 7 and 1. But Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. Now, if you just back up to 1 Kings chapter 6, it gives the record of Solomon building the temple. He spent seven years building the temple. Seven is God's perfect number, and he took almost twice as long, 13 years, to build his own house here at Baalbek. That tells us something, doesn't it? In verse 8, and it says, in his house where he dwelt, and had another court within the porch, which was like of the like work, Solomon made also an house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken to wife, like unto this porch. Now, it was absolutely forbidden in the Torah to marry pagan women. And he married Pharaoh's daughter, and of course we know that Solomon's sexual fallings was the thing that led him to rank idolatry. It was just terrible. You can see some of the maps of Jerusalem, and when you look at the Temple Mount, there on the east side of the Temple Mount, in many of your maps, it'll say the Mount of Corruption. Mm -hmm. And Solomon had many pagan wives, and it was the custom of these pagan wives, the firstborn child would be sacrificed. Yeah. And that was the place where Solomon went that far. I mean, we're talking about not just going a little bit bad. He went bad to the bone. And the Song of Solomon, which I didn't go into this aspect, but in the Song of Solomon, we also have references to Baalbek. And that's another whole level. We didn't even go into that in this presentation. But, you know, that's absolutely, absolutely a fact. Now, also in this area, we see multiple connections with Freemasonry. In 1 Kings 7, 13, and 14, and King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was a widow's son, you know. Is there no help for the widow's son? Mm -hmm. And, of course, in Freemasonry in the third degree, Hiram of Biff is the hero of the third degree of Freemasonry. And he is the worker on the temple, and he is slain while he is working on uh, Solomon's temple here in the Masonic legend. And then he is killed, and then the worshipful master, he raises him from the dead with the strong grip of the lion's paw, and every Freemason plays the part of Hiram Abiff. And Hiram Abiff is a composite character of two Hirams in the Bible. We're going to show them to you. And when the Freemason plays the part of Hiram Abiff, he is raised from the dead, and when he is raised from the the dead symbolically by the strong grip of the lion's paw by the master of the lodge he whispers the secret word into the master mason's ear and that word is so secret we can't even tell you mm -hmm. oh heck i'll tell you it's maha bone and uh that is the secret word that when masons know you know maha bone they go it's like throwing water on the witch in the wizard of oz ah! <laughs> but, you know, this is another one of the big lies about Freemasonry that what they do is secret. It is not. We know what you do when you crawl around on your knees in the dark in the lodge hall. You need to repent. Be ashamed of yourself. It goes on to say he was a widow's son of the tribe of Natali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass, and he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. In 2 Samuel 5 and 11, here is the other Hiram 
That is the Hiram of Biff is fictional, but it's made up of a composite of these two Hirams. In 2 Samuel 5 and 11, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David and house. And this led to an ungodly alliance between the Tyre, which was in Lebanon, Tyre and Siren is Lebanon, where Baalbach is also. And because of all of the money and all of the trees and all of the labor that Hiram, king of Tyre, gave into the temple, we'll read what it says. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, which was in Baalbek, now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Another outright violation of Torah to give the inherited land of Israel unto a pagan king. But at this point, obeying Torah was not on uh, Solomon's radar screen. He had gone bad, and he was trampling on the word of God left and right. He had gone full-blown into the dark side. Now, when anyone sees a clue here, just wave at me. 1 Kings 10, 14. Now, the weight of gold that came to Solomon one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. 666. So it's just the picture the word of God paints for us here is the sad picture of a man of God gone totally bad. And some scholars believe that in his old age, Solomon came back to God and that he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he was an old man. I hope that's true, but it can't be proven. I really hope Solomon came back to the Lord, but there's really no biblical proof of that. We can just hope that's the case. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. This is his house at Baalbek. Now, any way you want to slice it, that is a whole bunch of gold. That is just an amazing amount of gold that Solomon heaped into this place. I mean, it's just, uh, it speaks for itself. Now, this is even, this is even gets wilder. It, you know, like say there's more, it gets worse. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 18 through 20, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory, and overlaid it with the best gold. Now, this is in the house at Baalbek. This is not in the temple. This is the Baalbek house. And the throne had six steps. Well, of course it had six steps. And the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side of the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other, and with the, the 12 lions plus him, there we got the number 13. There's all kinds of numbers here that are, are so meaningful all throughout this story. And 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other, and upon the six steps there was not the like made in any kingdom. Now, we're going to look at the Septuagint here. And the Septuagint, which was an ancient a translation of the scriptures from Hebrew into Greek. Now, the Septuagint has a lot of problems with it, and I only use the Septuagint as a commentary. And many people, well, not many, but there's some that will want to argue that the Septuagint is the real authority. And that's really ridiculous because the Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew, and they want to make the translation more authoritative than what it was translated from, and that just is a little bit nonsensical. But because of its great age, it's interesting as a commentary, and you'll see what I mean right here. It says, and this is the Septuagint reading of 1 Kings 10, 19, talking about Solomon's throne. The throne had six steps and calves 
in bold relief to the throne behind it, and side pieces on either hand of the place of the seat, and two lions standing by the side pieces. Now, according to the Septuagint, there were calves behind this throne. Now, why is that important? And we've talked in a lot of midnight rides. We talked all the way back to the battle of the, of the kings that Abraham and Melchizedek were involved with. There was Ashtoreth Carnahim, Ashtoreth of the two horns. And we've talked about how the two horns that we see all through paganism whether on the Viking's helmet, that this came from the way that Venus will travel in the sky. It's sometimes a morning star, sometimes an evening star, and literally in its course through the sky, it would be like a helmet with two horns. And Lucifer was worshipped as the planet Venus. And we see, and, and it was the calf, the calf horns. Mithras was worshipped as a calf, the golden calf with uh when the law was given we have the golden calves of jeroboam in israel that were set up and uh this is huge and right here we see it and i would tend to believe that that uh solomon had gone that far that there were calves behind the throne because at this point the god that solomon was worshiping was not the true god of israel he went full-blown into the calf worship of paganism now, in 1 Kings chapter 10, for the king had a sea, had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Now, if it took them three years to make a trip and come back, I wonder where they were going. Now, this is what I believe, and I can't prove it, but I could go into a lot of things that could really buttress us, and in my mind, I can prove it, and in the mind of many other people, that I believe at this time Solomon was already coming over here to America. And there's even evidence, and, uh, and many people believe, that Solomon's copper mines were around Lake Superior, in, uh, up in the Great Lakes, and also in the eastern part of Kentucky. Now, I think this is something that's very, very probable. It says in verse 23, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom, and all the earth sought to Solomon. Now, maybe that means that all the earth really sought to Solomon, and on these three-year journeys where Solomon was going and bringing back riches, I believe that they came to the Americas. And there are we could talk about Hebrew letters being found here. We could talk also about uh, Canaanite writing up in the northeastern part of the United States. And I believe it took place at other times, but I believe it took place right here. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence of Hebrews here long before we were here, long before the Native Americans may have been here. Maybe some of the Native Americans are Hebrews, but you also have uh, this the idolatry and this you know just the idolatry version we have antediluvian temples here so like the idea that solomon wouldn't have came here or couldn't have come here would be to me be outrageous it would if he's the wisest man on earth that would mean he would know about one of the richest most beautiful places in the world right this huge yeah. continent we call america right yeah so. and i believe that those huge stones were there before solomon but i believe solomon learned the secret yeah. of how to do it. I, I do think too. Solomon was full-blown, tapped into fallen angel yeah. knowledge. I think he was hooked up, and I think that his great wisdom yes. and his great power, he totally gave over to Satan, yeah. and such a sad, sad commentary on that. Somebody says apes and ivory sounds like Africa. I'm sure they collected things from all over the world. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Yeah, yeah. that would indicate ivory, and, and this was cyclical. Every three years, they would go out, a fleet, three years, they'd come back, and that'd be plenty of time to go anywhere you want. Yeah. And uh, and the Bible says all the earth sought Solomon. And I think, you know, I, I just have a tendency to believe what the Bible says. Yeah. And when we take that literally, there's a lot of things we can see to buttress this idea that indeed uh, it was all the way to America 
that uh, Solomon did come right here at this time. Yeah. Now, I want to look at another thing here from McClintock and Strong, and it says here, Baal Gad will mean Baal's crowd. According to this view, Baal Gad would mean the place of God, Gad. Now, Gad was an idol, Isaiah 6511, supposed to have been the god or goddess of good fortune and identified by the Jewish commentators with the planet Jupiter. And we've seen that there was at this site a temple to Jupiter built and also a temple to Venus built right there at Baalbek. And this is borne out by the meaning of this name. And once again, we're going to go to the Septuagint. And we're going to see that the Septuagint understands this. And I bet that the people that translated the Septuagint, uh, it was done in Egypt, and Baalbek was called Heliopolis after the great Egyptian temple, that they were pretty hip on what was going on here. But anyway, it says here, But ye are they that have left me, and forget my holy mountain, and prepare a table for the devil, and fill up the drink offering to fortune. And this is literally speaking of the worship of this devil and of the false communion rituals and all the licentious rites that was taking place right here at Baalbek. Now, once again here from McClintock and Strong, we're going to read something that is going to enable us to trace it even farther. And the picture we have that at the bottom of Mount Hermon, we have the cave of Pan where Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. And you see, the gates of hell prevailed against Joshua from, from the cave of Pan where Jesus said that down to Baalbek, that was never taken. Joshua did a great slaughter there at Baalbek of these pagan kings, but they didn't possess it. And Jesus' saying has double meaning that the gates of hell will not possess. Yeah, they didn't possess it then. Yeah, Israel's backslid now. But the Israel of God will not be prevailed upon by these devils that come, place, come forth from this area. Now, the article in uh, McClintock and Strong, The Valley of Baca, and it says, on the name of the trees, it comes from the name of the trees, Bacame, the mulberry from which the valley probably derived its name. Some regard this as a valley, Baca, or plain in which Baalbek is situated. The rendering is the Gihenam, or ravine below Mount Zion. So basically what we're talking about, at the base of Mount Hermon where Jesus said the gates of hell will, that will not prevail, there are valleys that run to the southwest to Lebanon and then valleys that go to Jerusalem. And we're going to see how these valleys connect and we're going to see the scripture that talks about the pilgrims when they would go to worship at the feasts they would have to walk through these areas. And that had to be a little spooky. And here's one of them here in Psalm 84, verse 6 and 7. Who passing through the valley of Baca, this is that valley where Baalbek is, make it a well, the rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. And it speaks of the pilgrims as they come to worship at Jerusalem and the feasts that they travel through this valley. And we're going to see here again, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and we'll get the identification of Baca. And we see here that there's a valley in verse 22. It's connected with the valley of Gihanam. It's connected with in 2 Samuel 5.22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them. 
and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And like McClintock and Strong said, this was the Valley of Baca where Baalbach went, Baalbach was. And as it goes toward Jerusalem, it connects into what was called the Valley of the Rephaim, then the Valley of Gehinnom where they sacrificed the little children unto Moloch and burnt them alive. And it, it is just amazing. It says here in verse 23, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees, and let it be, when thou hearest the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And in this valley there was a great victory given unto David, because he obeyed the Lord and, uh, and moved and brought a tremendous victory against the Philistines in this very valley. Now, as I said earlier, when you look at the way the tribes inherited the land, to the bottom left, we have the tribe of Dan, and in the center, we have Manasseh. And before they got their own allot allotment, Ephraim and Manasseh both were there right at the foot of Mount Hermon. And Ephraim also was infested with the worship of the calf, and they went totally bad. In Hosea chapter 4, 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. And it was from this area, and it was from the tribe of Ephraim that the calf worship uh, became prominent in Israel in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and Ephrathite of Zareda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted his hand up against the king. And it was Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that established the worship of the calf in Samaria, and in Dan, and this was the, the main stream of idolatry that led to the total apostasy of Israel, and its spiritual root was all in this area that was never taken, you see, and when, this is a spiritual lesson for us, you see, when you cleanse yourself of idols, you don't want to stop without taking that six-pointed star off your, off your jewelry, off of your Bible. You don't want nothing to do with this. I guarantee you. This is toxic. This is not some game to play. Uh, this is ground zero for evil 101. And it, in Isaiah, now I want us to also, I want us to get the connection. There's so many other things. Ezekiel 31 talks about the Assyrian be a cedar in Lebanon. And here again, this goes back even to the Garden of Eden where we see these ancient primordial uh, fallen sephirim, and it says also there's scripture that says that the Assyrian built the kingdom of Babylon. So this is ground zero stuff here. This is ground zero of the total uh, progression of the kingdom of Satan with its war on the Israel of God. Now note here, this is a scripture we've read, and this thing's going to blow up right here. In Isaiah 17, 1 through 3, and we've talked about this a lot, the burden of Damascus. Now, we're 35 five miles from Baalbek at Damascus. You can see the lights of Damascus from the top of Mount Hermon where the fallen ones come down. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. Google Earth, it's still there. Don't tell me this is fulfilled. And it shall be a ruinous heap. And the, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress shall also cease from Ephraim. There's going to be a big blowback here. And Ephraim and Israel is heavily fortified there in the north on that border with Syria. And this was where Ephraim fell into calf worship at the very foot of Mount Hermon in this area from Mount Hermon to Baalbek in this area that was never taken. Well, the father's going to take it. He's going to set it on fire. 
The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And read the rest of Isaiah 17. It goes on to describe Israel after this as being just like when you pick olives. And when you pick olives and you shake the tree and there's just a few left in the top of the tree you don't get. This is the picture that is given in Isaiah 17 of Israel. What we're seeing here is a big war. And this will be the big war that will kick off the last half of the Daniel 70th week. We've synchronized this with Daniel 11, with the book of 2 Estrus, and with the book of Enoch. We've talked a lot about this. And it's so, the, the more you talk about it, the more it makes sense. And there's another scripture here in Zechariah 11 and 1 that speaks of this fire that's going to go out. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. This speaks of the same time frame as Isaiah 17 and 1, when God is going to judge this area. This area was never taken by Joshua, but right here the Father's going to take it back. He's going to burn it to a crisp, and the end time time clock of the last half of Daniel's 70th week is going to be set in motion right here. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour thy cedars. It's going to get real hot for those UN boys up on top of Mount Hermon. Man, and you know, it's so interesting. I remember when the speech was made, I believe by... I believe it was made by Obama, if I remember correctly. After 9-11, they planted a cedar tree there where the tower stood. And then he gave the quote about Lebanon and the cedar trees from yeah. the Bible. Oh, and yeah. he's basically pronouncing judgment on the United oh, States. Yeah. That was pretty interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Man. Very, very interesting. The United States tie to Lebanon and to all of that is interesting as well. It is know. hugely interesting. Yeah. What an awesome show, David. This has really been good. Um, you know, this... Uh, every time we uncover more things and, and get closer and closer and closer to finding out just so much more. Every little every show we do, I feel like we're finding out more steps just closer and closer to painting this massive picture that um, is hard to paint by just looking at regular history. You almost have to you have to take a deep dive into almost every little aspect of this to really understand it all. And we're trying to do that. It's really cool. And and the more we study, the more we pray. And the more we look to the Word of God for answers, the more dots connect yeah. and the more everything makes sense. Amen to that. So thank you guys so much for listening. We we, we greatly appreciate all of you who support what we do. Uh, without you guys, we could not do this. And um, it doesn't, it, we don't think of it lightly. Let's put it that way. We are, we are just super grateful to be able to reach this many people with biblical things is uh, a feat that could have only happened for us in in this time in 20 you know in this this century we just want to say until next saturday night 10 p.m central high five and good night everybody from the midnight ride and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up rise up rise up